Scully comes out of it there and banks it off the glass all the way to center. Uh, back again by Duchesne, knocked down by Plant. Plant slides in over the line. Plant took his shot. Oh! In order to understand the Buffalo Sabres. We have to go back. Now for Buffalo looking for the pass and gets it. And again, oh, couldn't get the shot away. Now he does. He oh. scores! Holy macro roll, the highlight film! And I mean way back. To Lafontaine, he gets tripped up, gets it to May, and over the line. He's May going in on goal. He shoots. He scores! The Presley gets it again. Daw charging after it. Clear right out in front. Backhand by Hannon. He scores! Dave Hammond! Dave Hammond is mobbed by his teammates! Dave Hammond finally put away the backhand! And this series is going back to where Jimmy Hoffa is! Back to the Meadowlands in New Jersey! Spencer keeping it in there. Now it's stolen away. And cleared out to center ice to Pumminville. Pumminville into Ottawa territory. Pumminville goes around Albertson. Cuts in front. Scores! Jason Pumminville! Short-handed! Oh, now do you believe? Now do you believe? These guys are good. Scary good. And they are going to either Carolina or New Jersey. The Buffalo Sabres Senators in overtime. Ruminen, Ruminen, he keeps it in by sending it in behind the net. Here's Green Bay to clear it out in front. Back it comes, kept in by Hesh. Penalty coming up to Philadelphia. But with the good, there's also the bad. Buffalo selects Jack Eichel. <laughs> Colorado trades Ryan O'Reilly and Jamie McGinn to Buffalo in exchange for Nikita Zadorov, Mikhail Grigorenko, and J.D. Comfer, and pick number 31 in the 2015 NHL draft.
to Roy. Roy swinging around. Roy still with the puck. Roy scoops it across ice. Dumped in front of the net. Off the goal post. They score! Finally jammed into the net. And Billy Leno comes back to Philadelphia and gets the first goal of the game. Buffalo Sabres, you have to go back. And way back. You have to understand their history. You have to understand just how much of a hockey town this is, even if it doesn't show it today. You have to understand all of it. You have to understand the good and the bad. You have to understand why fans are so upset with this team, why fans love this team, and why, or rather I should say how, how did we get here, right? From being, honestly, I'd say a well-respected team in the NHL, or if even not respected with all the fights and everything that happened over the years, a competitive team, like in that retrospect, a competitive team, a playoff contender to a bottom basement dwelling, sad sack of shit, a playoff drought, most ever in the NHL, and a place where players no longer want to come, a place that teams will trade and just get who they want for nothing. I mean, the Sabres went from being one of the most sought-after entertaining teams to a bottom-dwelling NHL farm team. We're going to go all over it today. We're going to go all over it. And it is just, this is going to hurt. This video is going to hurt to talk about, but it needs to be said. We need to talk about it. We have at least ended things in the 2022 NHL season on a bittersweet note. It's at least good to say, considering that it's just been, it's been tough out here. Being a Sabres fan, it's been tough the last 10 years or so. We're going to get into all that today, and hopefully you stick around to this point. I know there's a lot of audio, but there's so many good moments that need to be brought up in this video, and some bad. We're, we're going to be talking about all that today, and this video has just been long 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 overdue but here we are and today let's get started the sabers were founded in 1970 the sabers have been in the league for 51 years from 1970 to 71 up to 2021 and 2022 this past year the sabers have had 29 playoff appearances zero championships unfortunately our playoff record 124 wins 132 losses our all-time record 1837 wins 1603 losses 409 ties 178 overtime losses 4261 total points our all-time goals leader is joe bear perot 512 all-time points leader also joe bear perot 1326 points most goals ever in a season is held by alexander mogilny from 1992 to 1993 at 76 goals most points by a saber is held by pat lafontaine also 1992 to 93 with 148 points the sabers like i said have had a lot of names over the years i mean just a lot of names you you can't even sit here and tell me to name them all off because i'd be here all day but like i mean it's just insane you have Joe Bear Parole, Dominic Hasek, Ryan Miller, even Phil Housley, Rick Martin, Bill Hust, Mike Ramsey, Dave Andrichuk, Don Edwards, Thomas Vanek, Jason Pominville, Miroslav Shatan, Danny Briere, Chris Jury, Maximum Finneganoff, Tim Connolly. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. I, I can't sit here and name them all. I wish I could, but I'd be here all day. The Sabres really started to go downhill after the 2011 to 12 season. After that, that's when things just went downhill, I think, because their last playoff appearance was 2010 to 11 they were still competitive the following year but after that that's when everything went downhill but there was a move that happened after the 06 07 season sabers fans listening know what i'm talking about but we'll get to that let's just go over everything up to that point obviously in the beginning in 1970 to 71 that was their first season you had just three seasons later they lost in the quarterfinal and then two years after that 74 to 75 they lost in the stanley cup final they continued to be a competitive team right away i mean two years just two years after starting in the league they went to the quarterfinals they they didn't go the following year and then from 1974 to 75 all the way up to 1984 to 85 10 straight years they were in the playoffs they had two years they weren't and then they went back from 1987 all the way up to 1995 straight playoff appearances the following season 95 to 96 they didn't have it 96 to 97 up to 2000 to 2001 straight playoff appearances they had three bad years where they didn't get to the playoffs 05 06 they made it all the way to the conference finals the following year 06 07 conference finals didn't make it to playoffs for two years still competitive though then 09 to 10 and then 2010 to 11 lost in the quarterfinals both 
both years. After that, the Sabres haven't been back since. But, like I said, they've been a respected team up to that point. After that, they haven't been back since. Longest active playoff drought in the NHL. It is embarrassing, it is frustrating, and it's aggravating because they really shouldn't have been like that. With the moves management made over those years, they could have been a competitive team even after 06-07. They wouldn't have been out of the playoffs for two years before going back for two more years and then not going back at all after that if they would have made the right moves. The problem with the Sabres is they started going into this rut of getting rid of the right guys and bringing in the wrong guys. Trading away the right Right guys trading for the wrong guys, not getting enough in return, poor drafting, it is inexcusable. And then after a while, the core started to age, everyone's on the wrong side of 30, everyone starts to get traded, we don't get enough in return, continue to draft poorly, and then you become the worst team in hockey. Utter embarrassing. It's embarrassing. And the fact that Darcy Regeer had his job for as long as he had it, the fact that Tim Murray tried to rush everything, and the Dan Bilesma debacle, then Jack Lego didn't want to be here, I mean, I, it's just so Oh, so much shit. It's a steaming hot pile of shit. It really is. It really, really is. You had the early years of the team. You had the French connection from 1970 to 1981. You had the black and red era from 96 to 2006. You had ownership turmoil throughout those years as well. You had the return of the blue and gold with the slug, which was just an ugly jersey, but they were winning in it. And then you had the post briere and Drury era. You had the Bagula era, which is what we're in right now, and the playoff drought, of course. So the Sabres drafted Joe Bear Perot. They drafted Rick Martin. And then on March 4th, 1972, they traded with the Pittsburgh Penguins one for one, Rene Robert, Freddie Shaq. Created the French connection, went to the Stanley Cup Finals, unfortunately didn't win. They lost to Philadelphia. I, I still don't understand how. One of the best lines in NHL history and certainly is missed today by older fans. Joe Bear Perot played center, Rene Robert was at left wing and right wing, along with Rick Martin, they would rotate respectfully. The line was together from 1972 until 1979, and just took the NHL by storm from the minute the Sabres got there, it was an instant impact, and how we were able to get competitive right away was great drafting and making good trades, of course. Joe Bear Perot was the first ever draft pick by the Sabres in their 1970 entry draft in their inaugural season. He was the first overall selection, and the best... Sabres player to honestly come out of the organization. Some people may find that controversial, but the fact that Joe Burrell still holds records to this day for the franchise is honestly impressive. They've been around for 50 plus years now. I mean, he is still holding records, and I think that just shows for itself alone. The following year, 1971, Martin, Rick Martin, was the team's first pick, and then, like I said, Robert was traded by the Penguins for Eddie Shack in 1972, and this is what really helped start the French connection. The line played together until 1979. Played together for seven years. The three played together until the fall of 1979, because on October 5th, 1979, Scotty Bowman, the coach, traded Robert to the Colorado Rockies, that was their name at the time, and yes, before the baseball team, for defenseman John Van Boxmere. This ended the the French Connection era, these three players were the first to accumulate 200 goals in a Sabres uniform. Obviously, the French Connection's jerseys are retired and they all have their own banner with the French Connection on it, no question, but this, these guys would just score all the time. I mean, they were just, without a doubt, they were unstoppable and nobody could stop this team and it's just, it's just crazy how they couldn't win a Stanley Cup and they only went to the finals one time. They were close every other time, no question, but it's just crazy that they couldn't win one and it's kind of upsetting because they really deserve to win a Stanley Cup championship. They really did, along with the other players on this team. They were considered the most electrifying and explosive combination of that era. One of the last great lines in the history of the game with their, quote, flair and creativity, not to mention their mustaches and layered flowing hair of the era. They were looked up to, admired, and idolized by fans of all ages. New Englanders wanted to be Bobby Orr, but Western New Yorkers wanted to be part of the French Connection. I'm reading this off HockeyWriters.com. That is a great way to describe this team. They were just, they were icons. They were icons of the city, and they, they played the game well. I guess you had to be there. Obviously, I wasn't born, but, like, everyone tells me, the older fans who were there at the odd, they said you just had to be there to watch them because they haven't seen anything like them since, of course. It also says, when George Punch Imlach, the Sabres' first coach and general manager, again, hope I said the last name right, built the team in 1970, his goal was to create an exciting, high-octane, high scoring offense and he certainly did with the French connection don't get me wrong after drafting Perot and then Martin the following year new coach Joe Crozier knew he wanted a winger who could compliment them he found Robert and the rest is 
history. The French connection in Pact was immediate. Once together, they were the driving force behind the Sabres making the playoffs. They did so every season they were together, except for the 73-74 season when Perot suffered a broken leg and missed a few months. The first full season with all three members of the French connection was 1972-73, with Perot flanked by Martin and Robert. The Sabres were no longer a one-man show. The Sabres started the season with a 10-game streak. Reminds me of 2018. When unbeaten in their first 21 home games, finished a record of 37, 27, and 14. Good enough to make the playoffs for the first time in their franchise history. Perot, Robert, and Martin led the team in scoring, finishing with 88, 83, and 73 points respectfully. They fell to the veteran. And like Mark I said, Jokin instant impact. The following moments. season, it says here, the Sabres came out of the gate strong, winning six of their nine games in 73 to 74, but Perot suffered a broken leg, which we just said earlier. Sideline for eight weeks, team lost goaltender Roger Crozier with pancreatitis. Jeez. Also, Tim Horton died in a car accident that year, and all this was too much for the team to overcome, and the Sabres finished with a record of 32, 34, and 12, missing the playoffs. Kind of like, in a way, what the Raiders went through with Henry Ruggs and John Gruden and everything, Like, but it was just too much for this team to overcome, and that's what that's what happens when you have tragedy strike your locker room and injuries and stuff. That, that, can, that can ruin a season real quick, and the Sabres just wasn't their year, and they had to look forward to, to the next year. And 74 and 75 came out of the gate strong, and this is the year they end up going to the Stanley Cup final. It says here, the goals came in bunches, 354 for the team. More than a third of them were off the six of the French connection. Martin had 52 goals, Robert had 40 goals, and Pro had 39 goals. The trio finished among the league's top 10 scorers while leading the team to tie for first in the regular season standings. All three were chosen to play in the NHL All-Star game, obviously, no question. Most important, they led the Sabres to a Cinderella run towards the Stanley Cup in only their fifth season of the NHL. Sabres made their way to the Stanley Cup final. The Sabres defeated the Chicago Blackhawks in the first round, second round. Rene Robert scored the game-winning goal, gets past Montreal after losing to them earlier in 72 and 73. They now go on to meet the Philadelphia Flyers. There's also here, it says Game 3, the final against the Flyers, is known as the famous fall game played in Buffalo's Memorial Odd. With early summer hot and humid temperatures outside the arena, a crowd, and a lack of air conditioning, the ice was shrouded to fog. Wow. It was like a sauna inside with temperatures near the ice approaching 90 degrees in an apparent attempt to cool off a bat flew down around the ice surface. That's when the Sabres winger Jim Lawrence took matters into his own hands and knocked it right out of the air with his stick. From that point on, Lawrence became known as Batman by his teammates. The game was stopped and started at a total of 12 times due to these conditions. Given the extremely poor visibility, Flyers coach Fred Shiro and Sabres head coach Floyd Smith instructed their players to shoot as much as possible. With roughly a minute remaining in overtime, Martin picked up a loose puck along the boards, fed it to Perot after gaining the Flyers' zone. He dished it to Robert. In the far right corner, Robert beat the Flyer defenseman to with the puck, shot the puck at an extreme angle, quote. The puck surprised Flyers netminder Bernie Parent, slipping by him for the game winner, quote, it's almost impossible to score from that angle, said Robert. But I shot at the net, hoping somebody could get that rebound. It seemed to me he, Bernie Parent he's talking about, wasn't ready for the shot. It went between his legs, end quote. Through there, the French Connection scored four goals and 11 points in the series. The Sabres lost in six games, unfortunately. Fucking mind-boggling. Little did they know, it was the closest any member of the French Connection would get to winning a Stanley Cup. The playoff MVP was Flyers goaltender Bernie Perrin. He was outstanding, said Perot. They had a great team, too, but he beat us. We just couldn't score on him. He was stopping everything. And Bernie Perrin was a really good goaltender, no question. That's also understandable. I mean, the Flyers did have a good team, but just with the French Connection, how many goals they'd score, you would think they'd win one. They just didn't. They unfortunately didn't, and you just had to move on to the next season. In these games, in sports, in these playoff games, you gotta have a short memory, you gotta get ready for the next season, and you just gotta keep trying to get another bite of that apple. It says here, it was the only time they made it to the final. The Sabres were still competitive and they kept trying, and that's certainly something to at least respect in that regard. After the Stanley Cup final in 74 and 75, the team still was competitive, obviously. 75-76, the team continues their winning ways, impressive record of 46-21-13, dynamic line put up 286 points, Pro finished third in the league with 113 points, Robert had 87, and Martin had 86 points. 76-77, after a slow start, the Sabres finished in a second place in their division, 48-24-8 record. 
Perot led the team with 95 points, Robert was second with 73, and Martin, who only stood up for 66 games, had 65 points, so he was a point-for-point player when healthy. Following season 77 to 78, Sabres top 100 points for the fourth straight season, finishing with a record 44-19-17. Once again, Perot led the team with 89 points, Robert had 73 points in 67 games, Martin had 63 points in 65 games, the team got by the New York Rangers in a three-game series before losing to the Flyers again in five games. In 1978 and 1979, the Sabres cleaned house, firing both their general manager and their head coach. Both were shown the door. It says here, the Sabres picked up steam and finished in second place again with the record of 38, 36, 28, and 16. Once again, Perot led the way with 85 points, Robert finished third on the team in scoring with 62 points, and Martin with 53 points. Sabres lose to the Pittsburgh Penguins in the first round of the playoffs. The following year, 79-80, I mentioned this earlier in the video, but we're just going to go through it again. Scotty Bowman, who had led the Canadians to four straight Stanley Cup finals, this is when he was hired by the Sabres, by general manager George Knox. He broke up the French connection by trading Robert to the Colorado Rockies for John Van Boxmeer. The move paid dividends as the Sabres won the Adams division with a 47, 17, and 16 record. Perot tallied 106 points, 40 goals, and 66 assists. Martin notched 79 points during the season in the playoffs. The Sabres got by the Vancouver Canucks in four games, swept the Chicago Blackhawks, but they fell to the New York Islanders in six games. And this is around the time where the New York Islanders won four straight Stanley Cups in the 80s. I mean, it is what it is. That's just unfortunate for the Sabres. Just, I think, a bad luck. They were competitive. I mean, there's nothing you can really say. I mean, they were competitive. They played a six-game series. They didn't get swept, but it, it is what it is. The following year, 1980-81. Despite Perot being sidelined for 22 games with rib injuries, the Sabres won their second straight division title. On March 11th, Martin was traded to the LA Kings for traffic. Perot was the only player from the French Connection to stay with the Sabres his entire 17 career. He retired on November 24th, 1986. He was at the top of every single offensive category in history of the franchise. Still remains today. He has most regular season games played, goals, assists, points, game-winning goals, 30-goal seasons with 10, 20-goal seasons, and shots on goal in 1971. Perot earned the Calder Memorial Trophy and the Lady Bing Trophy in 1973. Hope I said that right. I've actually never heard of that trophy, so like this is a bit of a history lesson even for me. Martin holds the franchise career record for hat tricks with seven, four goal games, 40 goal seasons, consecutive 40 goal seasons, 50 goal seasons as well, tied with Danny Gare for those consecutive 50 goal seasons. While Robert's name does not fill the team's record book, his 40 goal and 60 assist season in 1974 and 75 was the club's first 100 point season by the player. It says here, during the seven full seasons the French connection was together, Parole led the Sabres in scoring five times while Robert and Martin led the team once each. Martin led the team three times in goals, Perot twice, Robert once. Perot led the team in assists four times, and Robert did so twice. All three members of the French Connection were selected for multiple All-Star games, and each was named to the official NHL All-Star team at least once, and to the All-Star game at least twice while playing together. In 1977, Martin was named the All-Star Games MVP in 1978, hosted at Buffalo's Odd. Perot scored the game-winning overtime goal. In 1990, Perot's number 11 was retired by the Sabres, and he was inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame. Quote, I didn't enjoy attention when I played, but the Hall of Fame is different. It's the greatest honor a player can have. Quote, by that's what Parole said. Having a chance to play for the same team for 17 years was a highlight. In my first year, I set a record in the NHL for scoring 38 goals. That was a highlight. Scoring 500 goals was a highlight, end quote. I mean, just the stuff these guys did, it's just remarkable. It's impressive. And all hockey fans really should take note of what these guys did because it's, it's remarkable. It really is. I've always known about the French Connection my entire life because my dad would tell me about him, but looking through this article definitely emphasizes just how important this trio really was to this team. Given that the French Connection had their own success, there were other players throughout those years on the roster that also helped provide success for the team. And looking here at 72 of 73, when the trio was here, you had guys like Craig Ramsey, Mike Robitaille, Don Lucci, Jim Lawrence. You had a young Pil Hotch. You even had Danny Gare. Now, Danny Gare joined the team in 74 and 75, the year they went to the final. In his rookie season, he had 62 points, 31 goals, 31 assists. The following year, 75 to 76, Danny Gare had 50 goals, 23 assists, 73 points. He did get hurt. He only played 35 games the following year. He, had he did have 26 points, though, in those 35 games. 77-78, 77 points in only 69 games, 39 goals, 38 assists. 78 to 
79. He had 67 points in 71 games, 27 goals, 40 assists, 79 to 80. Had 89 points in 76 games, 56 goals, 33 assists, and 80 and 81. 85 points in 73 games, 46 goals, 39 assists, 81 to 82. 43 points in 58 games, 20 goals, 23 assists, and 81 to 82 in 21 points in 22 games before getting traded to the Detroit Red Wings. Danny Gare, Sabres Hall of Famer, Hockey Hall of Fame, banner in the Raptors with the French connection. He's up there, no question. Again, great drafting by the Sabres. This is something that really helped them early on in their years become successful right away. Danny Gear was the second round pick, 29th overall in the 1974 NHL Amateur Draft. You even had defenseman Jim Schoenfeld, first round pick, fifth overall in 1972 for the Sabres. A defenseman, but he had here 74-75, 19 assists. 75-76, 22 assists. 76-77, 25 assists. 77-78, 20 assists. 78-79, 17 assists. 79-80, to 80, 27 assists. 80-81, to 81, 25 assists. He had a plus 60 rating in 1979 through 80. That's nuts. That is nuts for a defenseman. Speaking of defensemen, you also had Larry Playfair, who came out in 1978, and he was a first-round 13th overall selection by the Sabres. This guy is huge, and I met him a couple years ago. Really nice guy. Six foot four, 205 pounds, and I mean the dude is tall. Like like he that that six foot four ain't no joke. And this in this guy, you know, his stats don't show, but he. He, he was a great, he did his job, and he did it really well, and, you know, uh, my dad would tell me, he said, you know, if anyone tried messing with the French Connection, Larry Playfair was one of those guys who stepped right in, and I mean, you had these big defensemen, you know, defending your star players in case anybody tried to mess with them, and that's certainly something that I think even the Sabres now can use is a little more physicality. I mean, they got that with guys like talking that now, but they could still use that, but at least they're like starting to learn how to de- defend themselves again, because for a while, like Jeff Skinner was just getting pushed around and nobody did anything along with the other players. And like, nobody would stand up for each other. And you saw that a lot back in the day. And you saw that with the good teams too and good teams now in the NHL. So, you know, it's good to see the Sabres doing that again with talk and whatnot. And so we'll just have to, wait and see though on the team right now obviously first round pick 11th overall in 1979 defenseman mike ramsey by the buffalo sabers and he too also really good defenseman i mean this guy put a point and you want that from a defenseman you want him to be able to get if you have the high assists and whatnot you know these defensemen if they could help create plays for you that that's that's really going to help your uh, secondary scoring not that defensemen should be scoring goals but if they could really help you in the assist column i think that really just just benefits your team more than anything because they're helping your offense and generating plays alongside and mike ramsey here, you know, in the beginning, it was he didn't do much. First two years, rookie year, he only had seven points here in 13 games. In 1980-81, he had played 72 games, only had 17 points, but you see here, 81-82 had 30 points, 23 assists. 82-83, 38 points, 30 assists. 83-84, 31 points, 22 assists. 30 points again, 84-85, 22 assists. 28 points, 1985-86, 21 assists. 1986-87, 39 points, 31 assists. Can continued to be a playmaker until he was no longer on the team after the 1992-93 season, but from his age 19 season all the way to his age 32 season, pretty good career for Mike Ramsey with the Sabres, was here for 14 years, and in those 14 years, Mike Ramsey had 329 points in 911 games for a defenseman, that's not bad at all. I'll gladly take that. I think they definitely got their first round investment out of Mike Ramsey for sure. And you had much more names as well, but after 1979, that's when the French Connection disbanded, and that's when the Sabres then move on to the post French Connection era. You had Rick Martin around a little longer, but Joe Bear Perot was around until 1986. You had to reload the team right after the French Connection. It was big losses, and you had to make sure you were still having the talent come in and provide, the new talent come in and provide and help the new team, because at some point, you were going to have to move on from the French Connection, unfortunately. I mean, it'd be great if they could, all these guys could play forever, but they can't. You have to continue to, you know, build the talent around the roster and continue to provide depth and whatnot, just like in football. You have to continue to have good talent come in. You have to bring talent out and bring new talent in and just continue to reload, reload, reload and continue to have a consistent winner and that that's the only way you're able to gain long-term success. Unfortunately, all good things do come to an end. And with that, the French Connection ends, but a new era begins.
In 1981-82, the NHL realigned its conferences and adopted an intra-divisional playoff format, quote-unquote, for the first two rounds. It was the beginning of an era in which the Sabres would finish in the middle of the Adams Division standings with regularity, and then face the near certainty of having to get past either the Boston Bruins or the Montreal Canadiens to make it to the conference finals, aside from first-round victories over Montreal in 1982-83 and Boston in 1992-93. The era saw the Sabres lose the division rival Boston, Bruins, Quebec Nordiques, and Montreal Canadiens in the Adams Division semifinals first or first round. A combined eight times and missed the playoffs altogether in 1985-86 and 86-87. Only third and fourth times out of the playoffs in franchise history. Pro reached the 500 goal mark in 85-86 season, retired playing 20 games in 86-87, 17 years after joining the Sabres as their first ever draft pick. So the Sabres, like I said, they were competitive, but the Sabres did get knocked out of the first round several times, eight times to be exact. And while it was unfortunate, at least they were competitive and that's the point I was trying to make earlier this team was still competitive early on and it helped give your franchise respect longevity the longevity respect of your franchise and teams were like all right we're about to play the Sabres here we're about to play the Sabres now we're not we're not playing some bottom basement dwelling team you know they are now they're playing a competitive team and yes we were first round exits but at least they were still competitive and that's that's what truly does matter though obviously the big picture is the Stanley Cup with the French connection and after the French connection in general. Yes, the Stanley Cup is the main goal at the end of the day, but the fact that you were still competitive, that means something. And I think that that matters too at the end of the day, because if you're going to get to the Stanley Cup, point A to point B, you have to be competitive. Otherwise, you're just going to keep getting basement dwelling bottom, you're going to suck. Obviously, the main goal at the end of the day is to win a Stanley Cup, but in order to win a Stanley Cup, you have to be competitive and you have to win hockey games. And the Sabres were doing that, constantly going back to the playoffs. And they had years they were in and out, like I said, but they were still competitive in the long term and that's what mattered in order to get to a Stanley Cup given that 1974 to 75 was the last time around that era that the Sabres got to the Stanley Cup final throughout those years as well and they were competitive after the French Connection era which is important you also had right winger Mike Foligno join the Buffalo Sabres in 1981-82 just right after the French Connection ended he joins the team he was a third overall pick by the Detroit Red Wings but only lasted four years there but he had a 10-year career with the Sabres, had 511 points in 664 games compared to his 160 points in 186 games with the Detroit Red Wings. Surprised they moved on from him considering that, you know, Detroit, he, he, he was good in his first three years. You know, he had a down year his fourth year, but it's still surprising that Detroit decided to move on. Sabres acquired him in a trade, and this is what I mean by, like, the smart moves. It's not only, you know, drafting, but making the right trades for the right guys, and certainly did, Mike Foligno certainly helped his roster. In that trade, though, the Sabres gave up Danny Gare, Jim Schoenfeld, who I mentioned earlier, and Derek R. Smith, but they got Mike Valino, Dale McCourt, and Brent R. Peterson. Now, the way I look at this trade, Danny Gare continued to be competitive with the Detroit Red Wings, along with Jim Schoenfeld, although Schoenfeld's numbers dropped dramatically, I will say, after his final season with the Sabres, but Danny Gare was still competitive, as you can see here. In 1982-83, Danny Gare had 61 points in 79 games with the Detroit Red Wings. His first season there, 22 points in 36 games played, 26 games in only 63 games played. Obviously, you know, as Danny Gare's age, he wasn't getting any younger. Age goes up, production unfortunately goes down. Dale McCourt here, he had only three seasons with the Sabres, but he had 42 points in 52 games, 52 points in 62 games, contributed to the team along with Mike Foligno. Brent R. Peterson here, he had only 14 points in 46 games in his first year as a Sabre, 37 points in 75 games, 21 points in 70 games, 34 points in 74 games is his tenure here as a Sabre. Not a bad bottom six piece, though by any means. This this trade, I think, helped both teams, but I think with the Sabres getting Mike Foligno, getting rid of some aging stars, I think they, they won this trade. In the 1982-83 season, the Sabres drafted a young left winger by the name of Dave Anderchuk, 6'4", 220 pounds, 16th overall pick in the 1982 NHL draft. And Anderchuk, no question about it, Anderchuk, NHL Hall of Famer. This guy is just insane. A career totals here, 1,338 points in 1,639 games, played in the NHL for 23 years, 12 seasons with Buffalo, 4 with Toronto, 4 with the Devils, 4 with the Tampa Bay 
Lightning, one year with Boston, and one year with the Colorado Avalanche. Now, Dave Vanderchuk was no joke. Like, Dave Vanderchuk is no joke. I mean, he had 78 points in 80 games played in the 87-88 season, along with 112 penalty minutes. Dude's a savage. Dude was just a straight savage, and great pick by the Buffalo Sabres, no question. Hockey Hall of Fame 2017 here on HockeyReference.com. No, no question about it. A great pick for the Buffalo Sabres, and just another example of good drafting by the team. But before the Sabres selected Andrew Chuck, they also took a defenseman by the name of Phil Housley, 6 overall in 1982. Now, yes, obviously, Phil Housley as a head coach, two years with the Sabres, had 58 wins, 84 losses, and 22 overtime losses, and we all know how the Phil Housley tenure went, but we'll get into that part later. But as the hockey player, Phil Housley, inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame in 2015, one of the best defensemen to play the game, and can't go wrong with this. I mean, as a defenseman, Housley had not just assists, he also had goals, right? His second season in the league is an example here, age 19 season, season in 1983-84. Housley had 77 points in 75 games, 31 goals, 46 assists. I mean, as a defenseman, that's that's remarkable. That, that is remarkable. Following season, 84-85, another example here, 53 assists with 16 goals, 69 points in 73 games. The point totals were just about, if not even, maybe a little less. Housley had a good tenure here with the Sabres, had 558 points in 608 games with his eight-year career in Buffalo. After that, Housley was with the Calgary Flames for five years, three years with the Winnipeg Jets, two years with the Washington Capitals, and two years with the Chicago Blackhawks, along with one year with St. Louis, one year with the Devils, and one year with the Toronto Maple Leafs. Had a 21-year NHL career, 1,232 points in 1,495 games, 338 goals as a defenseman. Nothing nothing bad you could say about that. As a coach, eh, yeah, that, that, that part didn't go well. I try to just look at Phil Housley as the hockey player, not as the head coach that was here, because that tenure was rough. Not that it was totally his fault, but he certainly didn't help his case. But regardless, another great pick by the Sabres in the same year that they drafted Andrew Chuck. I figured while I mentioned Housley, I would also mention former Sabres player and head coach Lindy Ruff. And Lindy Ruff is still coaching today for the New Jersey Devils, although that is questionable as to how much longer he might be coaching the team. We all know Lindy Ruff is the Sabres head coach, but before that, Lindy Ruff played 10 years with the Buffalo Sabres from the 1979-80 season as a rookie all the way to 1988-89. I mean, a 10-year season. In 691 games, Lindy Ruff had only 300 points. He had 105 goals, 195 assists. More known for his 1,266 penalty minutes. He just fit the team. He fit the City, made sense as the coaching hire later on. Just just more of an honorable mention here. He was a second round pick by the Sabres in 1979, but just an honorable mention because Lindy Ruff was around during a lot of our glory years as the head coach. The Sabres in the fifth round, 89th overall in the 1988 NHL draft, took a right winger by the name of Alexander Mogilny. Yes, the six foot 210 Russian forward was an absolute beast for his short time career here with the Buffalo Sabres. Like I said, still holds a record with this team to this day, 1992 to 93 all time goal scorer, like in a single season with 76 goals. In six years of the Sabres, Mogilny had 444 points in 381 games. 211 goals, 233 assists. It was. It's a shame he was only here for six years, as he was then with the Vancouver Canucks for five years, three years with the Devils, and three years with the Toronto Maple Leafs. But he had a 16-year NHL career, 1,032 points in 990 games. McGillney is not in the Hall of Fame, although arguably I, I could see him in the Hall of Fame. I think he should be in the Hall of Fame. It, or if anything, at least in some type of Sabres ring of honor. But it's impressive for what McGillney did with his short six-year tenure here as a Buffalo Sabre. I mean, just just that 1992-93 season, 127 points in 77 games, the 76 goals, 51 assists. Just had to mention it again. Just absolutely insane. There was another fifth round selection, 97th overall in the, 1990, in the 1988 NHL draft, and he wasn't known for actually playing hockey. No, he only had 91 points in 900 career NHL games. He is known for his 3,207 penalty minutes, and that is Rob Ray. Ray and Domi are firing punches again. They'll be finished. 
finish for the night. Oh, and are they landing them? Holy mackerel. Now Ray got the sweater off again, trying to woo me over top. Ray and Domi are just trying to get at each other as the linesmen stand back. Now Ray gets Domi's helmet off. They're getting awfully tired. Ray trying to toss some short rights in there. It is. He's connecting on the side of Domi's head, and the linesmen get in, and this may be good night for 32 and 28. <laughs> there they go. In the fights over the years, Rob Ray, one of the main ones that a lot of Sabres fans always like to mention, along with Toronto fans, is the rivalry between Rob Ray and Ty Domi, Enforcer versus Enforcer, or Goon versus Goon, who had the better punch, who was the harder hitter, and they were just gladiators on the ice. It was a battle of the gridiron. It was, I mean, just, I, I can name it a million different ways what I'm saying here. You didn't want to mess with Rob Ray, and you didn't want to mess with Ty Domi. I mean, it was a different type of game back then too you have to take that into consideration the nhl doesn't necessarily have goons or enforcers anymore i mean the the sabers tried to do it in 2013 with john scott but i mean the dude every time went on the freaking ice you know the he'd barely tap a guy they put him in the box you know it's it's a shame that they're kind of getting rid of it i mean i understand player safety is important because it is but like when you have the actual enforcers running the player safety it kind of kind of there's irony there it's kind of ironic right like the, the player safety is a joke but like they're still trying to get rid of fighting i don't know man that that's a whole nother topic for another day but rob ray was just insane and he's you know still active with the sabers as a broadcaster with now former broadcaster rick generat and whatnot uh, with the sabers and the guy was a fighter the, the guy was a fighter you know like there's not really much more i can say i mean it's he's still around to this day you know helping the team as a broadcaster but obviously he's not the same robbery was you know 30 years ago he had a 14 year career with the sabers he had 3189 penalty minutes he had 90 points like i said in 889 games but he did have 40 goals to 50 assists by his 14 year tenure with the sabers he had one goal with the senators in the two years he was there we don't talk about that though i just don't like thinking about him in a senator's uniform that's gross that did happen too but he didn't really play much for the senators he only played five games in 2002 to three and six games in 2003 to four by that time as an enforcer you know you're just beaten up and you're broken from all the fights and everything and he had a 350 penalty minute high his second year in the league 1990 to 91 his age 22 season but when you get older as an enforcer your body's beat up and time for Rob Ray to put the gloves up it, it happens in the NHL it, it is what it is and that's the at some point you got to hang it up and it's you know like like with the NFL not for long it's same with the NHL I mean if you can make it work great but like it's these sports are not forever is what I'm saying and you just gotta you know live in the moment and do the best you can with the years that you got so ray had a hell of a career for being an enforcer and just definitely was able to back up his teammates and he did stir a lot of shit he did stir the pot and he has the famous espn commercial but you know for a fifth round pick really can't go wrong here good pick by the sabers hockey lore for fighting this guy just a great great thing for the game i, I don't care what anyone says he was a great thing for the game i don't care how dirty he was on october 25th 1991 the sabers made a trade with the new york islanders and acquired center Pat LaFontaine, 5'10", 182 pounds, was a first-round third overall selection by the Islanders in the 1983 NHL draft. He was around during the 80s with those strong NHL Stanley Cup winning teams, and LaFontaine, despite his injuries with the Sabres, when this guy was healthy, this guy could play. This guy could play. His first year with the Sabres, LaFontaine had 93 points in 57 games, 46 goals, 47 assists. The following season, 1992-93, this is a record he holds on the team, most points in a single season. He had 148 points in 84 games, 53 goals, 95 assists, and he could not stay healthy from 1993 through 1995, but his uh, final season that he was healthy as a Sabre was 95 to 96. He had 91 points in 76 games, 40 goals, 51 assists. And in 96, 97, he only played 13 games before he was ultimately traded to the New York Rangers for a second round pick, which ended up being Andrew Peters and future considerations later on, which was a 2005th round pick that was not exercised. But LaFontaine, with his final year in the NHL, with the, with the Rangers, he had 62 points in 67 games. Hall of Famer, no question about it. Inducted in 2003, he's on the rafters for the Sabres. And while that's controversial to some fans, when healthy, 
I mean, I think he deserves it. He was he was a baller when he was healthy, and if he were to stay healthy and play those full six years, he probably would have never left the team, and maybe would have played a little longer in his NHL career. But in 15 years, he had 1,013 points in 865 games, 468 goals, 545 assists. Good trade for the Sabers, lore for Sabers hockey. This this guy, you know, still talked about to this day, and he was with the Sabers as their president of hockey operations, but he ended up resigning a little bit right after Ryan Miller was traded to the St. Louis Blues. I feel like he it had something to do with it because I feel like something about LaFontaine not fully having a say. I mean, I'll look more into that as we get closer into that season. This guy was a good hockey player, though. It's unfortunate that he ended up resigning from his position at with the front office with our team, but this organization has had his ups and downs, so it is what it is. But before the Sabres traded for Pat LaFontaine, they drafted Pierre Turgeon with the first pick of their 1987 NHL entry draft selection, and he quickly made an impact with the team. During his rookie season in 1987-88, he helped the Sabres reach the playoffs for the first time in three years. He was joined in 1989 by Alexander Mogilny, who, with the help of Sabres officials, became the first Soviet player to defect to the NHL and cleared the way for all other Russian players to follow in the 1989-90 season. The Sabres would improve to finish with 98 points, third best in the NHL. The playoff utility continued with a first round loss to Montreal. Sabres traded Turgeon to the New York Islanders in 1991 as a part of the blockbuster seven player trade that brought Pat LaFontaine to the Buffalo Sabres. Makes sense. It was a huge trade. It was like four players for three players. A bit picks were exchanged. It's just, it was a blockbuster trade. And I, I think the Sabres won that trade though. Getting Pat LaFontaine, the impact he had with McGill and already on the team and everybody else joining the team and having Andrew Tuck drafted and just building this roster up after the French connection. And you still had Joe Bear parole there until 86-87. Having that guy there as his leader, eventually this team was going to have success again. You saw it coming, the being competitive and getting better and better, making moves and acquiring more stars and drafting better players. Eventually you knew this Sabres team was going to get good again and really good and it was coming soon. On August 7th, 1992, the Sabres traded for goaltender Dominic Hasek from the Chicago Blackhawks for Stefan Buigard. Again, hopefully I said that last name right. And a 1993 fourth round pick that was used to select Eric Days. So Dominic Hasek was traded for absolutely nothing, basically a bag of pucks. His two years with the Chicago Blackhawks were subpar at best, so it was understandable at the time. His first season with the Sabres, he had a .896 save percentage. But I will say, from 1990s, 93 and 94 season to his last season with the Sabres in 2000 to 2001, Dominic Hasek became the dominator. This was his career defining switch. This is when he started going crazy and became the best goaltender of all time. Obviously, he had his dominant years in Detroit, played a year in Ottawa, and then went back to Detroit. I mean, Dominic Hasek, no question Hall of Famer in 2014, was a 10th round selection, 199th overall by the Chicago Blackhawks. So, understandable that they ended up trading him. They're like, well, he was a 10th round pick. Yes, the NHL draft went that far back in the day, back in 83, and did not play until 1990. So it was understandable that they ended up just saying, all right, we're going to scrap this project. We're going to move on. The Sabres take on that project. They don't give up much for him. And the benefits outweigh the possible risk of taking that on. Considering that when Dominic Hasha came to the Sabres, he was already 28 years old, played all the way up till he was 36 with the Sabres before joining the Red Wings at his age 37 season. There's no question that Dominic Hasha was indeed the dominator. We're talking talking 0.930 save percentage, 1993-94 season, 94-95 season, 96-97 season, 0.932 save percentage in 97-98, 0.937 save percentage in 1998-99 when the Sabres went to the finals that year. He also had a 0.920 save percentage in 95-96, 0.919 save percentage 1999-2000, 2000 to 2001, 0.921 save percentage like I said. 13 shutouts in 97-98, 7 shutouts 93-94. This guy was just insane. When this, he was with the Sabres, Hasek won the Vesna not once, but won the Vesna more times than I could really count here in his career. He won the Vesna six times, and it's just insane that Dominic Hasek was just unstoppable, really. I mean, the highlight reel is just insane. If you looked him up on YouTube and you never saw the highlights, like, you have to look it up. It's just the guy was insane. Like, if you think Ryan Miller was nuts, Dominic Hasek was the man. So, without a doubt, a great trade for the Sabres, no question. And Hasek still lives on in Sabres' 
folklore and hockey fans' hearts and memories, of course. Just a great overall goalie for the game, and I think he really helped revolutionize the position. I mean, the puck would be at center ice, and Dominic Hasek would rush out there and tackle the guy. <laughs> like I said, the game was different back then, but he just did not give a single fuck, and he was, without a doubt, the guy. And he, although when he did leave Buffalo on bad terms, saying, I will always be a Red Wing, in my heart, he'll always be a Buffalo Saber. And I know he won a couple cups with the Red Wings. he always live on in my heart as a Saber. I don't care. In 1992, the Sabres in the fourth round, 83rd overall, took Matthew Barnaby a six foot 189 pound right winger and Barnaby like Rob Ray not known for necessarily playing hockey more so known for the penalty minutes 2,562 penalty minutes total Barnaby was like Ray an absolute goon an absolute fighter he, he was like Brad Marchand before Brad Marchand and if he was on your team like what he was with the Sabres seven years you love Matthew Barnaby but when he wasn't you fucking hated his guts and it was funny because when he was with Pittsburgh right after Buffalo for his for your tenure there. Him and Rob Ray got into a heated fight a couple times, and it just goes to show, man, I mean, you when you're on the same team with these goons, I mean, if they were on the same team, they loved each other. If they weren't, they were target number one, and it's just, it's funny how that came full circle, but Barnaby, you know, 2,562 penalty minutes in total. He had 300 points in 834 games for a goon. There's, there's really no standard there, but just thought I'd point that out. For a fourth rounder, another guy to protect and help out the team, defending its teammates, and just making sure that there's that physical aspect out there. Barnaby definitely did his job on that aspect. In 1992-93, goaltender Dominic Hasek joined the team in a trade from the Chicago Blackhawks. Obviously, we know this. So, in the 93-94 season, the following year, the Sabres faced the New Jersey Devils in the Eastern Conference playoffs in the first round. Despite Hasek winning a 1-0 quadruple overtime goaltending duel with Devils goaltender Martin Brodeur in Game 6, the Sabres' longest game ever, by the way. Buffalo would lose the series, unfortunately, though, in seven games. Another first-round playoff loss to the Philadelphia Flyers in the lockout shortened 94-95 season that followed by a fifth place finish in the Northeast Division in 95-96 as the team missed the playoffs for the first time in nine years. It was the first season under head coach Ted Nolan, the last for the Sabres at the Buffalo Memorial Auditorium. Nolan brought an exciting brand of hockey to Buffalo during his coaching tenure. Buffalo was referred to as the, quote, hardest working team in hockey, end quote. This season was also featured in the debut of walk-on veteran Randy Burridge, who earned a spot on the roster after he attended training camp on a trial basis. He scored 25 goals that season and was second in the team scoring to Pad LaFontaine. Burrid also earned the Tim Horton Award for being the unsung hero and was voted the team MVP. The final game of the Memorial Odd was played on April 14th, 1996, a 4-1 victory over the Hartford Whalers. Sabres principal owner Seymour Knox died a month later on May 22nd, 1996. This game was known as Adios. I, I see tons of posters and like bars and other places around Buffalo as like the final game of the odd and people still have tickets from it and the odd was despite the fact that it, when you go really high up you'd be lucky not to fall was a special place in everybody's heart and it was you know unfortunate to see the building have to be torn down but eventually you need a new arena the, you can't have the same arena forever and it will be better sweet also when the bills get a new stadium but it certainly you'll miss all those memories at rich stadium eventually you need a new stadium or arena in order to continue your franchise going forward because after a while obviously the building gets ran down and move on and start fresh and especially when you get a new arena, it definitely helps with rebranding your team, and that's certainly what the Sabres did in the following season in 96. That's when the black and red era started from 1996 to 2006, a 10-year era, and these jerseys were awesome. Consider the goat head, and one of my favorite Sabres jerseys. Sure, the Sabres are known for being blue and gold, no question, but when the Sabres were black and red, let me tell you, man, that was badass. Those days were insane. And I was only a little kid when I watched the Sabres, obviously, but that old 506 season. I watched them their final year in the red and black. It was a hell of a season with an unfortunate ending, of course. The one thing here it says Adams Northwest Division rivalry section when it mentioned that Ted Nolan in his first season was considered the hardest working team in the NHL. Uh, kind of reminds me of Don Granato in a sense where the Sabres aren't necessarily talented, but this past year the Sabres were considered a very hard working team and it's certainly looking at that and looking at the team now, a sense of hope that knowing that Granato is definitely leading his team in the right direction because it seems our former teams were able to build up and get better. Kind of like the same thing here with Granato and the Sabres. It seems like history is in a way repeating itself, you know, as long as the Sabres keep their 
other good players this time around, of course. The next section of the Black and Red era states, Ted Nolan and the Sabres rebounded in the 1996-97 season, their first at Marine Midland Arena, by winning their first division title in 16 years with Nolan winning the Jack Adams Award. As the NHL's top coach, Dominic Hasek winning both the Hart and Vesna trophies, first goaltender to do so since Montreal's Jacques Plante in 1962, Michael Pekka taking home the Frank J. Selke Trophy as the best defensive forward in the NHL, and general manager John Buckler, honored as Executive of the Year. However, the regular season success was overshadowed by what had taken place during the playoffs. Tensions between Nolan and Hasek had been high for most of the season after being scored upon in Game 3 of the first round against the Ottawa Senators. Hasek left the game, forcing backup Steve Shields to step in. Hasek claimed he felt his knee, quote, pop, and the team doctor pronounced him day-to-day. The Buffalo News columnist Jim Kelly, not the quarterback, James Thomas Kelly Jr., wrote a column that night for the next day's newspaper that detailed the day's events which irked Hasek. After the Senators won Game 5, Hasek came out of the Sabres training room and attacked Kelly, tearing his shirt. Despite the fact Hasek issued an apology, things went downhill after the incident. Shields starred as the Sabres railed to win the series against Ottawa, but not before the next series against the Philadelphia Flyers. The NHL announced Hasek had been suspended for three games, with the Sabres informing the NHL Hasek was healthy. Hasek most likely would have not been suspended had he not been cleared to play. Set to return in Game 4 with the Sabres down by three games to none, Hasek told the Sabres coaching staff he felt a twinge in his knee and left the ice after the pregame skate. Shields turned in another season, saving performance as Buffalo daved off elimination with a win in overtime. Again before Game 5, Hasek declared himself unfit to play, and Buffalo lost 6-3 and the series. Kind of a repeating event here, losing to the Philadelphia Flyers. If you don't already hate the Philadelphia Flyers as a Sabres fan, watching this episode will certainly make you hate the Philadelphia Flyers even more. It also says here, Team President Larry Quinn fired General Manager John Muckler, who also had a noted feud with Nolan. Hasek, who supported Muckler, openly told reporters at the NHL awards ceremony he did not respect Nolan, placing General Manager Darcy Regeer in a tough position. He offered Nolan a one-year contract for reported $500,000. Nolan refused on the grounds of his previous contract was for two years. Regeer then pulled the contract off the table and did not offer another one, ending Nolan's tenure as Sabres head coach. Nolan was offered several jobs from the Tampa Bay Lightning and New York Islanders, which he turned down, and was out of the NHL until June 2006 when he was named the head coach for the New York Islanders. Former Sabres captain Lindy Ruff was hired as head coach on July 21st, 1997, agreeing to a three-year contract. The Sabres organization, after having their most successful season in nearly two decades, had fired both the reigning NHL Executive of the Year and Coach of the Year. Yeah, that's life as a Sabres fan. It is nuts. There's a history of when these teams are good. There, there's always something going on behind the scenes, it seems, with the Sabres. It's always something. It's not It's not a good look for the franchise when they have such a great bounce-back season, only to be fueled with drama, and it just it's not a good look for the organization. It, 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 it ruins your reputation with shit like that. And now that you have Muckler and Nolan leaving, and Regeer and Lindy Ruff coming in, now they gotta take over, pick up the pieces, and continue to be successful and that's not always a good spot to be put in especially with Lindy Ruff coming in for being a first-time head coach with the Sabres like you weren't already nervous or if you didn't have nerves before that you certainly were going to now because now you had to you had to regroup your team and you weren't even like you you kind of walked into this situation so that's just crazy that's just crazy really certainly Lindy Ruff had to pick up the pieces and quick because in the NHL you have a short memory and you had to get get your team going again and make another run at that cup and the Sabres certainly did that though they, they certainly continued to be competitive throughout those years but it's just it's just it's a shitty way to end the season that's for sure not only that but like this happens in the playoffs not the regular season but in the playoffs when every game matters and when you're trying to win a cup like this is what you play the entire 82 game season for and now there's tension in the locker room with player and a coach and not just a player but your franchise starting goalie arguably the best goalie in the league at that time and the best and, and looking at it now the, the best goalie ever and it's just not a good look for the organization. It's a horrible look for the organization. I mean, you're trying to win the cup. You're in the playoffs. You are in the dance. And now you're feuding. It's just, it's, that's so frustrating. And oh my God. Luckily, we had Steve Shields who stepped in and he tried his best. But Steve Shields is an old Dominic Hashik. And, you know, playing those tough Flyers teams, man, you're not, you're not going to win without Hashik. It's just, that's just really frustrating. And now you have new Sabres head coach Lindy Ruff coming in with his franchise goalie upset. 
that. And you have Darcy Regeer, brand new general manager, trying to see what he can do to fix this, build off of what happened, and try and make another run the following season. That's just very frustrating. And the Sabres needed to definitely bounce back after that. And if they didn't bounce back from that, then they weren't going anywhere. Then you weren't going to go anywhere. And then if they didn't bounce back from that, Lindy Ruff and Regeer would have been fired right away. And who, who knows where the franchise would have went right after that. But it's just, that's really frustrating for sure. So the following season in 1997 to 98, the Sabres, which had lost $32 million over the previous three seasons, nearly missed payroll in December 1997. Awesome. They were sold by North... North... Northrop Knox to John Riggis, owner of Adelphia Communications, which was, quote, an American cable television company with headquarters in Gordersport, Pennsylvania. Shortly thereafter, Quinn was dismissed and replaced by John Riggis' son, Timothy Riggis, behind Hashik left winger Minishoff Shatan, who led the team in scoring, right winger Donald Audet, center Michael Pekka, and several role playing journeymen, including Matthew Barnaby, helped the Sabres reach the Eastern Conference Finals that season, but lost to the Washington Capitals in six games. On March 18, 1997, the Sabres made a trade with the Edmonton Oilers, acquiring Minishoff Satan for Craig Miller and Barry Moore here, looking at the NHL trade tracker. And Satan, when joining the Sabres, led the way in multiple categories and was certainly a huge factor in going to those giant playoff pushes and making a far postseason run against the Dallas Stars and whatnot. And joining the Sabres, Satan had 46 points in 79 games. Following season, 66 points in 81 games, 67 points in 81 games in 99 2000 62 points in 82 games 73 points in 82 games in 2001 to 2 75 points in 79 games in 2002 to 2003 57 points in 82 games in 2003 to 2004 there was the lockout following that and he went back to Slovakia and played for them before hitting free agency the Sabres didn't resign him of course a recurring theme and Shatan went on to play with the New York Islanders and Pittsburgh Penguins and Boston Bruins for going back to his home country and playing hockey until 2013 to 14 but Jatan was certainly a huge benefactor for the Sabres while he was on the team of course and naturally of course they don't resign him which is just aggravating in 98-99 Jatan scores 40 goals the Sabres would add centers Stu Barnes from the Pittsburgh Penguins and Joe Junu Juenu Joe the fuck how do you say this name Joe J- Juenu hopefully I said that last name right from the Capitals and the team finally returned to the Stanley Cup Finals this time against the President Trophy winning Dallas Stars. In Game 6, Stars winger Brett Hall's triple overtime goal ended the series. The Stars were awarded the Stanley Cup in 1999. It was illegal to score a goal if an offensive player's skate entered the crease before the puck did. However, NHL officials maintained that Hall's two shots in the goal mouth constituted a single possession of the puck since the puck deflected off Hasek. The rule was changed the following season allowing players to be inside the goaltender's crease as long as they did not interfere with the goaltender which is absolute bullshit i mean if it's a fucking rule that year it's a rule you can't just allow something to fucking not you you can't just allow the rule to no longer exist because you're changing it the following season you're playing the current season that the rule qualifies under the sabers had a cut i'm telling you right now if this didn't happen the sabers could have won this series the sabers this could have happened the sabers could have won this series (sighs) i mean they were both really good fucking teams don't get me wrong the Dallas Stars were loaded but the Sabres I think really could have won it and they, they put up a dog fight I mean they went to triple overtime it's just frustrating absolutely heartbreaking gut-wrenching I mean there's no fucking other way to say it he fucking kicked the puck I mean he fucking kicked it motherfucker cheated and they just allowed it look I wasn't even alive then or maybe I was like a baby I I I, I have to look at like the actual date here but you how 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 do you allow that <sighs> It says here the next year was a disappointing season. Naturally, how could it not be? You have a shortened off season with a gut wrenching fucking ending like that. Naturally, you're gonna have a fucking playoff or Stanley Cup hangover, kind of like in the NFL with the Super Bowl hangover when the team doesn't win. Naturally, the team struggled in the regular season due to injuries to Hashik as well as other tired and discouraged players. Doug Gilmore was acquired from the Chicago Blackhawks at the trade deadline, spiked the Sabers to a playoff berth. However, Gilmore was striking by stomach flu during the postseason, and even Hashik's return 
Cleveland could not prevent a first round playoff series loss to the Philadelphia Flyers once again. Like the previous season, there would be an officiating controversy in game two. Flyers left winger John LeClaire put the puck in the net through the hole in the mesh. While replays appeared to show the puck entering through, quote, side of the net, the goal was allowed to stand anyway because fuck Buffalo, really. The Flyers would win the game 2-1 to one and go on to win the four-game to one series. Captain Michael Pekka sat out the following season 2000 to 2001 due to a contract dispute. He was later traded to the New York Islanders in June 2001 in exchange for Tim Connolly and Taylor Pyatt. Even so, quote, the Sabres still defeated Philadelphia in six games in the first round of the playoffs. That's right. With a resounding 8-0 victory in the series winning game. In the second round, they faced the underdog Pittsburgh Penguins, led by juvenile superstar Mario Lemieux and captain Yarmir Yager, who had won the Art Ross Trophy that season, losing on a seventh game overtime goal scored by defenseman Darius Kasparitis. I hope I said that last name right. But if someone wants to give me a class on these last names, I'd really appreciate it. After lengthy and failed negotiations with their star goaltender, the Sabres traded Dominic Hasek to Detroit following some of 2001, bringing the five-year era of playoff success to a close. Without Hasek and Pekka, the Sabres missed the 2002 playoffs. Just like that, the Sabres lose their team captain and lose their franchise goalie. What a downward spiral. And that just sucks. That's just, that just, that leaves a shitty taste in my mouth. And this happened over 20 years ago. It's, it, that's just, again, gut-wrenching to say the least. Oh, God, this hurts. This hurts reading it. I couldn't even imagine watching it. Be like 13 seconds all over again. That's just, that's rough. That's rough. After lengthy and failed negotiations with their star goaltender, of course, the Sabres traded Dominic Hasek to the Detroit Red Wings in the summer of 2001, bringing the five-year era of playoff success to a close. Without Hasek and Pekka, the Sabres missed the 2002 playoffs. You lose your captain and your franchise starting goalie. Naturally, you're going to miss the playoffs the following season. Just, just, just bad management is a reoccurring theme, and it's going to continue the more we go down here. And the thing, too, when Hasek left the Sabres, I remember listening to WGR and Jeremy White was talking, and Dominic Hasek said, I will always be a Red Wing. I will always be a Detroit Red Wing. Hasek did not leave on good terms. Michael Pekka did not leave on good terms. Ted Nolan did not leave on good terms. This is a reoccurring theme. John Buckler did not leave on good terms. It's a constant reoccurring theme with this organization, and it damages your reputation. You're not getting any better by losing your star goaltender or your team captain because of contract disputes. Clearly, you're not doing a good job of negotiating contracts if guys keep fucking leaving. Listen, Tim Connolly comes, and when he was younger, when he comes to the team first, he produces. I mean, Taylor Pyatt's more of a bottom six guy. Tim Connolly and Taylor Pyatt don't make up for losing Michael Pekka. They just, they don't. Inexcusable by the Sabres. Just a little extra note here on Michael Pekka. So on July 8th, 1995, the Sabres acquired Michael Pekka and Michael Wilson along with a 1995 first round pick, which they used to draft Jay McKee, a defenseman. In return, the Canucks get Alexander Mogilny and a 1995 fifth round pick, which they used to select Todd Norman. Now, this honestly, I say the Sabres win this just because they got Pekka and they draft Jay McKee. Really, you get Pekka and then the Canucks get Mogilny. I think that's a win-win trade for both teams, really. I mean, Mogilny, when joining the Vancouver over Canucks here, 1995-96, has 107 points in 79 games, 55 goals and 52 assists, 96-97, 73 points in 76 games, the following season, 97-98, 45 points, 51 games, 98-99, 45 points, 59 games, following season again, 38 points, 47 games, obviously age starts to take a role here, production does go down, but he was still at the top of his game for a couple years with the Canucks, I mean, obviously Michael Pekka isn't an Alexander Mogilny, but I think he certainly help this team, not just being a role player, but you also have him become the key team captain and whatnot. And Jay McKee obviously becomes a top pairing defenseman. It's more of a Buffalo, I think Buffalo wins in the future and the Canucks win right now, but it's still a win-win trade in my opinion. Now with Pekka joining the New York Islanders, you had to move on. And it's not easy when you lose your team captain. That's never easy because he's the main guy on your roster, the guy everyone looks to. That's not always an easy thing to 
replace, and certainly now the Sabres had to find a new team captain. And this is also going to be a reoccurring theme. The Sabres trade their team captains, and honestly, you're not going to have good stability in maintaining leadership if you're constantly moving out your team captains. You're not going to be able to structure and keep a good locker room by constantly getting rid of the number one guy leading that locker room. That's not that's not an easy thing to always recover from, especially with good team captains over the years like Michael Pekka, Chris Jury, Daniel Breer, etc. And that's just something that the Sabres never fully seem to understand until really now. And right now, we don't even have a team captain. We haven't had a team captain since Eichel left. And even before Eichel became the team captain, there was a little bit of time where the Sabres still didn't have a team captain. Haven't really had a true team captain since Chris Jury and Daniel Briere being the co-captains 2005 and 6 and 2006 and 7. With the Islanders acquiring the rights to Michael Pekka on June 24, 2001, just a couple days later, June 30th, 2001, the Sabres trade hash it to the Detroit Red Wings for Kozlov, a first-round pick, and the conditional pick in 2003 that wasn't exercised, which was mentioned earlier in the video, but just still frustrating because the Sabres did not at all get an, anything in return. They drafted Jim Slater in 2002. I don't even know who that is, and you don't have a franchise goalie. Like, yeah, Marty Baran was coming up at this time, but Marty Baran's not a Dominic Hasek. It's just, just absolutely frustrating that you got rid of the best goalie of all time, when he really could have finished his career as a Buffalo Sabre if you would just, you know, negotiate a fucking contract right. So next here, we have ownership turmoil, the NHL lockout. This has been mentioned to me by multiple friends I know when asked, when did the Sabres, what went wrong? What went wrong with the Buffalo Sabres? A couple of the older fans I know, no, no disrespect, but they mentioned that ownership turmoil was definitely a huge part of the downfall of the Buffalo Sabres. And sure enough, this certainly was a huge case because your franchise has to start at the top and when ownership ain't right, your team ain't going to be right. And it's really frustrating that all this was really a downward effect even right after the 99 final. It says here that in May 2002, John Riggis and his sons were indicted for bank wire and security fraud for embezzling more than $2 billion from Adelphia, Pennsylvania. Riggis was later convicted and appealing a sentence of 15 years in prison. The NHL took control of the team through the Riggis family remained owners on paper, but they were no longer officially owners. For a while, there was no interested buyers. Shit, I'll buy the team. I'm just kidding. After the two-year period of uncertainty, including rumors of relocating to another city, or even just straight out folding, the team was sold to a concertium led by Rochester, New York billionaire and former New York Goober National candidate Tom Golisano and former Sabres president Larry Quinn, whose bid included no government funding. Golisano was introduced as team owner on March 19th, 2003. And this is even before the 2002-3 season begins. Just, what the fuck? With 2002-3 season having started under NHL control, general manager Darcy Regeer could make only minimal moves, quote, however, with the consolations of impending new ownership, the team began their rebuilding process around the March 2003 trade deadline by clearing out veteran players. The first to go was winger Rob Ray, who was sent to the Ottawa Senators, which I mentioned he didn't play much for the Ottawa Senators, played 11 games in total for the team. The team then sent center and team captain Stu Barnes to the Dallas Stars in exchange for winger Michael Ryan and a draft pick. Here we go again, trading away team captains. Like I said, it's a reoccurring theme with this team. When you get the C as a Sabre, it's basically like, oh shit, I'm the next guy out. It's like, is, is team captain even an award? Because it seems like it's just a nice way of saying, we're going to give you team captain as like a nice piece to, you know, trade you. Because when talking to their team, we're going to be like, oh yeah, yeah, he's he's our team captain. You know, it's, it's fine. It's fine. Like Michael Ryan didn't do shit for this team. I, I remember Michael Ryan was like a big deal when I was younger and I could never understand why. But seeing now that you trade your team captain, Stu Barnes, Michael Ryan's going to have extremely high expectations to make up for the loss of Stu Barnes. And that never happened. Michael Ryan didn't do anything here. And then you get a draft pick. I understand you're trying to rebuild, but you couldn't get more for Stu Barnes? And you trade him to the Dallas Stars, a team that beat you in the playoffs? I hate Darcy Regeer. A third deal sent center Chris Gratton to the Phoenix Coyotes with a draft pick for Daniel Briere and a draft pick, adding a player who would play a key role in the Sabres resurgence in later years. Naturally, good trade by Regeer here, I will say, making up for Stu Barnes, but still, you're telling me you could get enough for Stu Barnes? The 2003-4 season saw the team emerge from its financial struggles through the Sabres narrowly missing the playoffs, the development of prominent young guys, young players, although it says the 2004-5 season was canceled due to a labor dispute 
league and NHL Players Association were able to agree on a new collective bargaining agreement in the summer of 2005, thus enabling NHL hockey to return 2005 to 6 season. On January 19th, 2005, the Sabres lost their main cable television broadcaster as Empire Sports Network, which has been on the air since 1991 to this point, seized operations in a cost-cutting move during the Adelphia scandal and reorganization. Like the Sabres, Empire had been owned by Adelphia prior to the NHL's seizure of the franchise, and just seeing all the moves the Sabres made makes me want to have a seizure. Adelphia sold their rights to the Sabres telecast from the 2005-6 campaign, Madison Square Garden Network, MSG, a New York City-based channel which broadcasts the Rangers, Islanders, and Devils games, took over the rights to broadcast Sabres games to television viewers in Western New York, with the Sabres controlling all aspects of the broadcast. The agreement was later extended through 2017, then again through 2027. Obviously, we all watch games through MSG, no problem. Just, that's a nice detail to add there, because I feel like all that ownership turmoil, it, it all comes full circle. Not just for the team, but as a fan watching the game, now you have to watch it on a different channel because ownership's incompetent. Like, it's just, it's it's upsetting. In 2005-6, to six, the Sabres took off. <sighs> Finishing their best record in over 20 years, clinching their first playoff berth since that 2000 to 2001 season before losing Pekka and Hasek. The team finished the regular season with 52 wins, surpassing the 50 win mark for the first time in franchise history. They also finished with 110 points, their first ever 100 point season in 23 years, and tied the 1979 to 80 club for the second best point total in franchise history. The Sabres tied the Ottawa Senators and Carolina Hurricanes for the most wins in the Eastern Conference. They finished with the fifth best record of the NHL behind the Detroit Red Wings, Ottawa Senators, Dallas Stars, and Carolina Hurricanes. Buffalo defeated the Philadelphia Flyers in the first round of 2006 playoffs in six games and top-seeded Ottawa in five games. The Sabres advanced to play Carolina in their first Eastern Conference Finals since 1999. However, injuries began to mount. This would be the driving factor to not making it to the Stanley Cup Final. They were forced to play without four of their top defensemen. So, Tempo Newman, Dimitri Kalinin, Jay McKee and Henrik Tillinder were all hurt. Top power play scorer Tim Connolly, through much of the series, was also hurt. Despite this, Sabres forced the series to seven games before failing to the eventual Stanley Cup champion Carolina Hurricanes. The Sabres' impressive season was recognized on June 22, 2006 at the NHL awards ceremony when Lindy Ruff edged Hurricanes coach Peter Lafayolette to win the Jack Adams Award as Coach of the Year in the closest vote in the awards history. Ruff was the second Sabres Sabres coach to do so in winning the award. Again, hope I said that other last name right. Bear with me on that. I apologize if I said it wrong. This certainly was a nice turnaround for the organization. Unfortunately, it didn't last, but this was a nice turnaround to make up for the mistakes that they made after that 1999 final. Because through 2000 up to 2003, it was really frustrating. A frustrating time. A short, dark period for the Sabres. It was nice to see a resurgence with Daniel Briere and having Tim Connolly emerge after trading away Pekka and having Jay McKee work out as a top pick and just rebuilding and having a good roster again. And of course, defeating the Philadelphia Flyers after losing to them so many times in series finals and the Stanley Cup final back in 74 to 75. One play that happened in that series, which is famous in Sabres lore, was when defenseman Brian Campbell hit RJ Umberger. And now the Flyers will pick it up and bring it back. Oh, what a hit by Campbell! Holy mackerel! Campbell stepped into his check in the blue line! Now they're all chasing after Campbell! Brian Campbell leveled his check at the blue line. Now that was Umberger, and he had his head down big time, and Brian Campbell ran over him like a Greyhound bus. That's why you don't keep your head down. Keep your head up. Serves you right, Philadelphia. Okay, so after this series, the Sabres lost to the Carolina Hurricanes. The following season, the Sabres did another rebrand, this time returning to blue and gold. But it wasn't your normal blue and gold with going back to the swords. It was, this time around, it was the slug. Another rebrand for the Sabres after just rebranding only just a decade ago. So the Sabres start the 06-07 season on a 10-0 start, setting a new franchise record for consecutive wins to start a season, becoming just the second team in NHL history after the 1993-94 Toronto Maple Leafs to open a season with a 10-game winning streak. Again, reminds me of 2018, although they didn't open the season like that, but just pointing it out there. They also set a new NHL record for consecutive road wins to start the season with eight, which was extended to 10 games, tying the team record for consecutive road wins. With a 7-4 win over the Carolina Hurricanes after previously losing to them in the Eastern Conference Finals on November 13, 2006, the team reached the 50-win 
plateau for the second time in franchise history. The Sabres won the President's Trophy for the first time in franchise history, giving them home ice advantage for their entire run in the 2007 playoffs. They also tied the 1974-75 team's franchise record that was with the French Connection at their best year for points in a season. The team defeated the New York Islanders and the New York Rangers to reach their second consecutive Eastern Conference Final. However, quote, on May 19th, they were eliminated by the Ottawa Senators after five games, and that was a fucking hell of a rivalry, a hell of a fucking series for the Sabres. I mean, it, I don't know if there was another team at that time the Sabres really could hate it, because they played each other the previous year in the playoffs, and that was a fucking dogfight. The, there was really no other way you could look at it. I mean, they were in the same conference, same division. I mean, they're in the same division now, and th- there's just no telling what, what else you could have expected. I mean, there was the giant, the famous sprawl when Chris Neal hit team captain Chris Jury, and then all of a sudden Lindy Ruff put all the fourth liners out there, and, you know, Adam Mayer, Patrick Coletta, who was a rookie at the time, and Andrew Peters, and then Marty Baran also gets into a fight with Ray Emery after they put all their stars out there, and, you know, Lindy Ruff said in the blue and gold special, he's like, you go after our guy, we're gonna go after yours, and Lindy Ruff was screaming at Ottawa's head coach, and it was just a fucking gladiator match, and Jeremy White, who was at the game, who was in the presentation, said, you know, it was the loudest the arena ever was, and he said, people wanted blood. We wanted blood, and it was just a fucking, it was a dogfight, and it was unfortunate the Sabres couldn't win, but that, that was a tough Ottawa team. It was, they were neck and neck, and it's just crazy that they couldn't get it done, because after that was the initial turning point of the entire franchise, that now we look back on this next move I'm about to talk about, and everyone still wonders why we did what we did, and what led to the eventual long-time downfall of this franchise. But before we get into that, obviously, I have to play the clip from the fight between the Senators and the Sabres in that series, because how could you not mention that, especially with RJ having his final call this year? You gotta, you gotta have tribute to RJ. And now the Sabres sending out, now we've got pushing and shoving going before the puck is ever dropped between Heatley and Coletta. Peters is out there as well, and Mayer at center ice, and Mayer trying to go after Spencer. Spencer doesn't want anything to do with it. Played back in the line, and everybody carrying up at center, and here goes Mayer after Spencer. Now Mayer gets grabbed from behind, and they all pile in there now, and Biron is looking for Emery. Here's Biron trying to get his gloves off, and Emery wants to go too. Biron and Emery, they are back near center ice as they grapple, and everybody else is teeing off of one another. Emery fires a punch down on the ice, the two goals under go. Now here's Peters trying to get back in there again. Well, there's an example. You go after one of our best players, we're going after yours. And Absolutely. That's what this is about. Buffalo Stars, and 
Lindy immediately send out Mayor Coletta and Andrew Peters. And just hats off to Lindy Ruff for, you know, sending out the guys and just, we're not going to take your shit. That That's what that was. You hit our guy, we're going to go after yours. And Lindy was a team captain himself, and he used to fight people back in the day when he was on the team in the 80s, and he wasn't going to sit there and take that shit. Fuck that. I don't blame him. And still hats off to this day to Lindy for just fucking going after their stars because it's like, all right, you want to play this game? We'll fucking, we'll play this game too. And I don't blame, I don't blame him for doing that. And of course, you know, the Sabres got fined and everyone got fined, but fuck that. Who cares? Like, you go after our guy, we're going to go after yours. And I certainly am glad that when the Sabres were facing the Islanders at the end of the season this year, they went after their guys for going after our guys. And that's what you need. If your team needs to, you know, protect each other and be unified. And, you know, if someone's fucking going after one of your friends, like in real life, not just in sport, if someone's, you know, giving your friend shit and then he starts, you know, if he hits him or whatever, you got to stick up for your buddy. And that's what kind of like what the team did here. And you get, if you're going to have a team, it's like a brotherhood and you got to stick up for your brothers. And the Sabres haven't done that for a long time. And that's why like I'd be at games and I'd be screaming like, how come no one's going after this motherfucker? I remember being in the game. The Sabres were playing the Panthers. I think it was uh, 2019. And Keith Yandel. And yes, Jeff Skinner talks a lot of shit. But Keith Yandel hits fucking Jeff Skinner in the boards. And then he fucking picked him up and basically fucking slammed him to the the ice. Basically a wrestling move, not even hot. And no one did a fucking thing about it. I was in the 300 level. I was screaming at the top of my lungs. How come nobody's fucking doing anything? Because it made me think of this. I mean, I grew up watching this. You go after our guy, we go after yours. And I'm, I'm glad to see Granada was like, Granada was happy when the team stood up for Skinner and whatnot. And like, I'm happy to see that's happening again. Because when it wasn't, I was like, is this even a fucking team? Is this even a brotherhood? Because clearly it wasn't. So still though, point being, hats off to Lindy Ruff for sticking up for his, t his guys. Nothing more you can say about it. I mean, it, and the fans are going crazy, and they said in the Blue and Gold presentation that there was a pizzeria that was willing to pay for Lindy Ruff's fine, and it just goes to show the love that this city has for the Sabres, and just how much of a hockey town this really is, and it, like I said, it's sad what happened. It really is. It's so sad and just fucked up that this team got so bad after this season. Well, not right away, but eventually they did. You slowly saw the downfall, and after this season because they get rid of Daniel Briere and Chris Jury. Just Darcy Rogier should have been fired right after that. You let go of not one but both your team captains? You should be fired. I don't care. I don't care that he got Drury and Briere and whatnot. It, it's not even just that. You get rid of Hashik, you get rid of Pekka, you get rid of Stu Barnes, you get rid of Briere and Jury, and then you know you let JP Dumont go too, and just like I mean, you can even go on the fucking NHL games year by year. Really, if if you you don't believe me. You could go on the NHL, the video games, year by year, and you watch the Sabres stacked roster slowly deplete. And it's just, I, I don't know how else to say it. Like, it's just fucked up that, like, you can't negotiate contracts. You can't fucking do your job right as a general manager. You shouldn't be the general manager. And then the Sabres decided to fucking keep your gear in power anyway because ownership didn't give a flying ass shit, really. It's just, it's embarrassing. It's it's pathetic. It's fucking stupid. But before we get into the the post Briere jury era, I just want to mention here. July 3rd, 2003, the Sabres make a trade with the Calgary Flames for Chris Drury and Steve Began. The Flames get Steven Reinprecht and Rhett Warner from the Sabres, a two for two trade, no draft picks involved. And sure enough, the Sabres, obviously, without a question, do win this trade because, I mean, you get Chris, you get Chris fucking Drury, right? A solid, a solid guy in your locker room, a solid team captain, and somebody who put up points for this roster and he was only with the Flames for one year but with the Flames that year in 2002 to 2003 Chris Jury put up 53 points in 80 games 23 goals and 30 assists before joining the Sabres in 2003 to 2004 having 53 points in 76 games 18 goals and 35 assists 2005 to 6 67 points in 81 games 30 goals 37 assists 2006 to 7 69 points in 77 games 37 goals and 32 assists Progressively gets better year by year. And the Sabres decided, and they're mine. We're going to let him go. And we're not just going to let him go. We're going to let go of Breer too. After trading for him as well. Like, what were you fucking thinking? So, Drury goes on to play with the Rangers for four more years. And in two of those four years, he's still 
Chris Jury before, obviously in 2009, 10, 20, 10, 11 age, the progression happens, you slow down, body breaks down, we, we know. But 2007 to 2008, first year with the New York Rangers, Chris Jury has 58 points in 82 games, 25 goals, 33 assists. 2008 to 2009, 56 points in 81 games, 22 goals, 34 assists. And then in 2009 to 10, only 32 points in 77 games, 14 goals, 18 assists. And 2010 to 11, 5 points in 24 games, 1 goal, 4 assists. Obviously, everything caught up to him at that point. But still, I mean, if the Sabres would have kept Chris Jury, could have had him for at least four more years. And who knows if his numbers would have got better with the Sabres after that 2006 to 7 season, or if he would have relatively had the same numbers that he did with the New York Rangers. But it just, it's just, there's no fucking excuse to lose a player like Chris Jury. When Chris Jury joined the Sabres and he got went into the locker room, they, they mentioned this all the time when everyone talks about Chris Jury. All the former players that played with Chris Jury, all the documentaries, you want to fucking name any Sabres thing. They always mention about Chris Jury. When Chris Jury got there in the locker room, he said, why is there no pictures of the Stanley Cup up? He said, he's every fucking former player that played with him mentioned it. He said, why is there no pictures of the Stanley Cup in here? Like, this is the goal. Why is there no Stanley Cup pictures in here? He put pictures of the Stanley Cup in the locker room. You adopt a winning culture by just that alone. Having a guy like that step up saying like, guys, this is the goal here, right? Solid leadership right off the bat. And a guy that everyone's like, he's right. You know what? This guy's right. Like, this is what we're playing for. And the team starts to gather around Jury. A solid fucking move. You don't give up anything, really. I just, that that's inexcusable by the organization. Ex just inexcusable. And... There's like 15 different ways I've heard the story of getting rid of Breer and Jury, but we'll go over that in a minute. Like I mentioned, on March 10th, 2003, the Sabres traded Chris Gratton for Daniel Breer and draft picks were swapped with that 2004 third round pick. The Sabres drafted Andre Sakara, who became good serviceable defenseman with the team. And Breer's stats when joining the Sabres, we already went over, but would like to just mention 2006 to 2007. Daniel Breer leads the team in points with 95 points in 81 games, 32 goals, 63 assists and you let him go why it's 2022 and i'm still upset about this this is like yeah the following season 2007 to 2008 breer's first year with the philadelphia flyers 72 points in 79 games 31 goals 41 assists he didn't play much in 2008 to 9 says here he only played 29 games but he had 25 points in those 29 games says here i guess he was with the ahl for a little bit with the phantoms their farm team in philadelphia four points in three games Games, one goal, four assists. 2009 to 10, 53 points in 75 games. 2010 to 2011, 68 points in 77 games. 2011 to 2012, 49 points in 70 games before his final season with the Flyers having just 16 points in 34 games. Obviously, age and everything catches up. And with the Montreal Canadiens for a little bit in 2013 and 14, Colorado Avalanche in 2014 to 15 before retiring. He was in the DEL in 2012 to 13 during the lockout but yeah uh, it's just it's really inexcusable that you couldn't even keep one you got rid of both Darcy Regeer should have been fired right then and there Th there's no excuse you get rid of a guy after having a 95 point season that's got to be a slap in the fucking face to Daniel Breer Danny Breer mentioned he's like I thought I was going to be a Buffalo Sabre forever Chris Jury and both of them mentioned in multiple articles we didn't think we were going to leave and they were shocked that they ended up not staying with the Sabres everyone was and when you talk about July 1st 2007 Sabres fans don't like to talk about it. And we still don't like to talk about it. It was fucking rough. It was fucking painful. It just just still overflow with emotion. I remember being a kid, right? I, I was in first grade. I mean, I was young, but I was in first grade for that 2007-8 season. I remember before in before the season even started, I remember seeing the Buffalo newspaper that day that Chris Jury signed with the New York Rangers. It was the front cover of the sports page. They showed Jury signing with the Rangers, and then the bottom of that sports page, they sh I think it was in the bottom, could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure on that same page, they show f Daniel Briere signing with the Flyers. It just, I remember being a kid and crying. I mean, the Sabres really just knew how to ruin my childhood just a little bit. Not to say I had a bad childhood, but they, they found a way to ruin some moments in my life as a young kid. Emotional damage. There's just absolutely no excuse. There, there's no excuse for it. And it, I was talking to my neighbor one day. We I run into him every now and then, you know, getting the mail or, you know, he's getting the mail at the same time, but whatever. But we were talking and he's got, he's got two little young kids, two little young boys. And like, I was just mentioning to him because we were talking about sports we talk about sports all the time and i was like they they're never gonna understand they're never gonna understand what it was like watching the sabers in that 
05, 06, 06, 07 run. They're never going to understand. And because we've been bad for so long, they're never going to understand what it's like to have a really good hockey team. And I also mentioned even with the Bills, I said, they're never going to understand being in a playoff drought for that long. Understanding just why we're so hyped about the NFL draft every year. Even being as good as we are and knowing we're a late round pick. I mean, it used to be our Super Bowl. But they grow up knowing that the Bills are a good team and the Sabres aren't. Well, for us, it was growing up vice versa. The Sabres were a really good team and the Bills weren't. And it's just something I wanted to mention because like even, you know, younger fans that are younger than me, obviously, they're never going to understand it. They're never going to get it. And I'm hoping that the Sabres with Kevin Adams and Don Canaro can really get this rebuild right. It just, I'm hoping they can because they need to. Some other trades here I want to mention the Sabres building this good team up again and having that good run. They ended up trading for some role players, right? So June 22nd, 2002, the Sabres acquired Jochen Hesch for draft picks that they used to move Kozlov, who was involved in a trade previously. I can't, I'm not going to even attempt that first name. It's He's Russian. And we used a pick from that trade to acquire Jochen Hesch. And then the Sabres trade on July 24th, 2002, Eric Rasmussen for Adam Mayer. Given these guys were bottom six players, you need to have good bottom six players in order to have success. And also, speaking of bottom six, March 9th, 2004, the Sabres acquire Mike Greer for Jacob Kleppis. Another move here, March 9th, 2004, the Sabres acquired Jeff Jilson, along with draft picks for Curtis Brown and Andy Delmore. We already mentioned the Chris Jury trade. August 25th, 2005, the Sabres acquire Tony Ludman in exchange for a 2006 third round pick that was used to select John Armstrong. I remember, not that he ended up being anything, but another big name was Tim Kennedy, who the Sabres acquired from the Washington Capitals on July 30th, 2005 for a sixth round pick in 2006. He didn't end up really doing anything for the roster, but he was another example of a player that was supposed to come up and help the Sabres get better, and he ended up playing in 2009-10, to but he didn't really do anything for the Sabres. I mean, he had 10 goals and 16 assists for a total of 26 points in 78 games, but he didn't live up to anything. He was another, just an example of a failed piece that was supposed to work, and of course it didn't work, because this is going to be, the reason I'm mentioning this is going to be starting to be a recurring theme, because the Sabres would trade for young guys like Michael Ryan, like Tim Kennedy, who didn't work out, and that was part of the fall of the team. You acquire younger guys hoping they'd work out, and they didn't. Kind of like with the Sabres right now, you know, they acquire Peyton Krebs. Obviously, Peyton Krebs is getting better with our team, but that would be like saying, Peyton Krebs, we acquire him, and he doesn't work out. That doesn't help us. It, it just it goes to show you that it didn't work out. Also, when the Sabres lost Breer and Jury, they traded in 2007. This is the same year they lose both of them. They traded trade Marty Baran to the Philadelphia Flyers for a 2007 second round pick that ended up being TJ Brennan, which this pick doesn't work out. Another example of us not getting anything in return for a trade. So obviously Baran wanted more playing time. He was the starting goalie before Ryan Miller, but Ryan Miller emerges. No question. Ryan Miller's a better goalie than Marty Baran. Obviously the Sabres are going to keep Miller over Baran just because of how dominant and clutch he is, or just because of how dominant and clutch he was at that time. And the Sabres had like probably the best goalie tandem in the league. I mean, you have two number one starting goalies. You don't even have a backup goalie. I mean, Baran was a number one goalie, and then Miller comes and emerges, and you have two number one goalies. That's how stacked this roster was. Well, not anymore. It's just, it goes to show, man. And you lose your top guys, and then you trade other pieces, and you try to replace those pieces in the draft, or even through a trade, and you don't get enough in return, you're not gonna have a good roster. So, now you lose Baran, and you have to move on from that. You have to get another, you have to have another goalie come in and play behind Miller now, and that's what the Sabres did the following year in signing Jacqueline Thibault. He was nobody perfect, but the Sabres needed a backup goalie and they just signed him. Certainly not Marty Baran, certainly not the same type of player, and certainly not the same type of guy you're going to have in that locker room because he, he was around from the moment he was drafted into the program. And just losing guys like that, Baran, you lose Briere, you lose Drury, it's not a good feeling for the guys that are coming back the following season. That, like, if you're Pominville or Roy or Vanek, you're like, what the heck? It's not going to be the same locker room. And they, I mean, it's Yes, the NHL is a business, but it certainly was not a good effect for the team. Like I said earlier, getting rid of Pekka and Hashig and Stu Barnes, your, your roster is not getting any better by doing that. And considering that the Sabres were considered a Stanley Cup contending team, well, now you're not. Like, what what were they thinking here? We're going to go into another rebuild? No. Why, why would you even think that when you had two Eastern Conference Finals appearances? Like, that would be like the Bills right now being in back-to-back playoff runs and being like, you know what? We're going to trade 
Josh Allen, and Tredavious White. Or Josh Allen and Stephon Diggs. You're going to trade the heart and the soul. Well, Drury's the heart, Breer's the soul. When you get rid of a heart and soul, what are you left with? You're just left with a body. That's kind of what happened with the Sabres, and it's depressing. So getting into exactly what happened between losing Breer and Drury, reading it here off of HockeyWriters.com. The high-octane Sabres led the league in goals that season, talking about 2006-07, and finished with 113 points, earning the franchise's first ever President's Trophy. We mentioned this earlier. Buffalo entered the playoffs as a heavy favorite to win the Stanley Cup. Breer proved that his performance that season wasn't an aberration, registering 95 points while remaining healthy throughout the entire year. Drury established himself as the greatest clutch scorer in team history, leading the Sabres to several comeback victories in both the regular season and the NHL playoff. As the season wore on, it became more and more evident that management would have to choose between them, especially with Vanek, who had a colossal jump from 48 to 84 points between 2005 and 6 to 2006 and 7 to become a restricted free agent. Though the Sabres were better than the year before, they fell short of the Stanley Cup, losing yet again in the Eastern Conference Final, this time to their division rival Ottawa Senators. The loss stung a bit more. Fans knew that another run without one of Breer or Drury would be much more difficult. The conscious across Western New York was that Drury would be the one to stay. Local sports pundits and fans felt that Vanek would continue to progress and eventually match Breer's production, making him more expendable and citing Drury's leadership and clutch situational ability as irreplaceable. However, nobody expected what would happen next. July 1st, 2007 is quoted and is true in this article as the darkest day in Sabres history. Nothing could have prepared Sabres fans for that day. Absolutely nothing. Not even in their wildest dreams could they imagine that the front office was so inept, hearts sank as the clouds ticked closer to the opening of free agency, as it was very likely that the Sabres had failed to strike a deal with either Briere or Drury. By 6 o'clock that evening, both players had been scooped up by new teams, leaving Buffalo empty-handed. To make matters worse, a few days later, the Edmonton Oilers extended a ridiculous 7-year $50 million offer sheet to Vanek and Regeer was forced to match the offer. If he hadn't, the Sabres would have lost their top 3 point producers in the same offseason. Buckle up, it gets worse. In an attempt to save face, the team spun the situation by villainizing Drury. Rumors spread that the team had a deal in place with Drury, but he chose to leave for greener pastures. While there was some truth to this claim, it was later revealed, when put into context, how poorly Sabres management had handled this situation. According to the Buffalo News, Drury and the Sabres had agreed on an extension prior to the 2006-07 season. Great, right? Although both parties agreed to a five-year extension for the co-captain, the Sabres neglected to send an executed contract to Drury's agent. That's right, folks. After verbally agreeing to the deal that would lock down the most important player on the roster, the front office failed to get a signature. What happened, you ask? Nobody really knows for sure. Perhaps the Sabres got cold feet and instead of informing the player, they simply ignored the situation, hoping it would go away. Oh, Jesus. Following this unfathomable saga, the Sabres reached back out to Drury to sign the deal after he registered 69 points a career high that season. At that point, the franchise center felt spurned by the organization and refused to negotiate a new contract. In his new autobiography released on Thursday, only available in French for now, Breer revealed just how negotiations went down with Regeer and company after they realized that Drury wasn't coming back. It says here from hockey writers in Daniel Breer's autobiography, Mr. Playoffs, I was so proud to be a member of the Buffalo Sabres until the very last minute. I thought I was going to spend the rest of my career there. Like all the people around me, I could see that time was running out and nobody in the organization was giving me a sign of life. But I was so convinced that a positive outcome would come to the Sabres leaders for their silence. After finding that no deal was possible with Chris Jury, the Sabres finally turned to me and asked if I was interested in staying in Buffalo. There was only a week left before the opening of the market. I then had to face the facts. I had never been a part of their plans and they wanted to submit an offer to me not to look bad. My agent Pat Bryson response was make us an offer but we will also wait for proposals from other organizations and we will see at that time. 72 hours before the opening of the market the Sabres then submitted a five-year proposal worth a total of 25 million dollars six months ago. I would have signed this contract with my eyes closed to make sure I stayed in Buffalo. In fact at the beginning of 2007 the Sabres could have secured the services of their two co-captains for a sum totaling of 46 and a half million but we were at the end of June circumstances had changed in my opinion it was not really a question of money but rather a question of pride and responsibility
respect. For the past six months, the stubborn silence of the organization had been elinquent. Damn! Damn! Moving on, Breer has confirmed that as many fans suspected, the Sabres waited until the very last minute to offer their best offensive playmaker a contract. They are lucky that Breer was open to an extension after the organization dragged him to arbitration a year prior. In a three-year span, Regeer managed to build the best team in the NHL, and in one fell swoop, completely destroyed it. He had the opportunity to lock down the two best players on the team, but instead assumed that losing Breer in the pursuit of jury was inevitable. And and alienated both the men in the process. Despite all of his great moves, as the longest tenured general manager in team history, Regeer will be forever known solely for this monumental blunder and deservedly slow. I fucking hate this man. If the Sabres handle things differently, for those who haven't slammed their computer screens in frustration, believe me, I want to right now. It says, let's speculate on what could have happened if the franchise had done the logical thing, pursued extensions for their co-captains. If the Sabres, Brass had managed to fully execute the reported contract offers to Jury and Briere, they would have secured the services of both the players under $10 million with the league's salary cap set at $50.3 million for the 2007-8 season. Those deals would have been manageable, although it is unclear what the Sabres' self-imposed cap was set at. Vanek's contract would have been the only other outstanding negotiation that offseason. While it's easy to criticize the Sabres in hindsight at the time, Vanek had the makings of a marquee player. Obviously, nobody could have anticipated the ridiculous offer sheet that the Edmonton Oilers would send his way, but that's what gear got for waiting. His tendency to hold off until the last minute to negotiate with players was maddening. If the front office had any foresight whatsoever, they could have easily retained Vanek for a much smaller price. Let's assume that Breer and Drury were locked down with shiny new five-year contracts, and Vanek was the lone opening contract heading into free agency. It's reasonable to assume that the Oilers would have extended Vanek with that offer sheet. Edmonton had very little to gain by sabotaging the Sabres' future plans, so they clearly had their eye on Vanek from the start. In fact, they may have been more likely to extend an offer with what would have been a very tight cap situation in Buffalo. Regeer would likely have accepted the four first-round picks in exchange for the 23-year-old. Yes, that's right. The Edmonton Oilers were willing to give the Sabres four first-round picks in exchange for 23-year-old at the time, Thomas Vanek. In this retrospect, what would have been an absolute steal while productive throughout the remainder of his career, Vanek was never able to match his output from that 2006-7 season. So this only makes matters worse. It says here, but who knows? if the Sabres would have continued to contend in the East. It's easy to play armchair general manager in retrospect, yes. But however, over a decade later, the Sabres still haven't recovered from Regeer's mistakes and the team hasn't won a playoff series since. Fans are still waiting for the quote, better days, end quote, as they were promised. And that is a fucking fact. That is an absolute fact. Here we are in 2022, still talking about something that happened back in 2007. Ugh. Like I said, this video was gonna hurt to make. So it says here now, looking at the post Breer jury era section here, here, through Wikipedia, obviously checking our sources to confirm this information. It says, once the Sabres lost both co-captains, we are going to Philadelphia, Chris Drury going to the Rangers, and obviously Vanek nearly goes to the Edmonton Oilers. After all this happened, after all these events with this chaos, the team changes its policy on not negotiating contracts during the regular season. Clearly you fucking weren't negotiating jack shit if you fucking waited to the last minute to try and negotiate with Breer and Drury. You weren't negotiating during the year. Or you just didn't choose to because you guys procrastinated to the last minute. Anyway, longtime Sabres broadcast color commentator Jim Lawrence announced his retirement during the preseason. Hockey night in Canada's Harry Neal took over his position in October of 2007. During the 2007-8 season, the Sabres hosted a game against the Pittsburgh Penguins on January 1st, 2008, which was played outdoors at Ralph Wilson Stadium, home of the National Football League's Buffalo Bills. Officially, the game was called the Amp Energy NHL Winter Classic, known as the Ice Bowl, due to its taking place at the same time as college football games. The Sabres lost 2-1 in a shootout, the Sabres failed to qualify for the 2008 playoffs, and became only the third team in NHL history to go from finishing first overall in the regular season standings to finishing out of the playoffs the following year. Naturally, lose Jury, Briere, trade Baron. what more can I fucking say? You're not gonna be any better. You're only gonna get worse. You're not improving whatsoever by doing that. And again, you're ruining your reputation as an organization, waiting to the last minute, and then turning your your players, your guys who wear your name, your brand, your jersey against you. You're just ruining your reputation, and nobody's going to want to come and play for you. And this was the start to Sidney Crosby being a villain origin story 
for Sabres fans after this Winter Classic game and ruined my childhood, not literally. On June 10th, the Sabres announced their new AHL affiliate beginning in the 2008-9 season as the Portland Pirates from Portland, Maine. This ended their 29-year affiliation with the Rochester Americans. They signed with the Pirates for two seasons with a parent club option for a third. The Sabres entered the 2008 free agency period quietly, but on July 1st, signed goaltender Patrick Laleem to a two-year contract after letting Jonathan Thibault go. Now, Patrick Laleem comes in as the backup goalie to Ryan Miller. Three days later, the Sabres acquired Craig Reve from the San Jose Sharks in exchange for a second-round pick in each of the next two drafts. The Sabres also extended the contracts of three players, Paul Gostad, four years, Ryan Miller, five years, and Jason Pominville, five years. Miller was slated to become an unrestricted free agent following the upcoming season, while Pominville was set to become a restricted free agent following that season. So you can give fucking Paul Gostad a four-year contract, but you can't give Breer or Drury a five-year contract. I'm going to keep coming back to this because it's just, there's no fucking excuse. None. I'm going to keep coming back to it for the rest of the video while Regeer's still with the team. On October 8th, the Sabres named defenseman Craig Reve team captain, the first single full-time season captain since Stu Barnes from 2001 to 2003. Long time. Basically, if you were the Sabres captain before that, it was basically the kiss of death. That's the way my dad described it, and that's the perfect way to describe it. The team was also active at the trade deadline. First, they signed Tim Connolly to a two-year $4.2 million extension. They then acquired Mikael Telquist from the Phoenix Coyotes for a fourth-round pick in the 2010 draft. They also acquired center Dominic Moore from the Toronto Maple Leafs for a second-round pick in the 2009 draft, while receiving a 2009 second-round pick from the Edmonton Oilers for forward Alesh Korli. On April 9th, the Sabres were eventually eliminated from the playoffs. General Manager Darcy Regeer announced on the first day of free agency following the elimination from the playoffs that the Sabres would sign unrestricted free agent Steve Monador to a two-year contract. They also signed free agent defenseman Joe Depento to a one-year contract on July 11th and extended contracts with three other players, Andre Sekera to a multi-year deal, Clark MacArthur to a one-year contract, and Mike Greer to a one-year contract. Greer, having played two seasons with the Sabres, returned after playing the last three with the San Jose Sharks. So Greer comes back to the roster, joining the bottom six. After only playing two games with the Sabres that season, Daniel Paye, a former first-round pick, was traded to the Boston Bruins on October 20th, 2009, in exchange for a third round and a conditional fourth-round draft selection. Paye's move to Boston marked the first-ever trade of a player under contract between the two division rivals in their common 39 years in the NHL. On January 1st, the Sabres became the first team to win consecutive games while trailing by three or more goals since the Dallas Stars did it in 2005 to 2006. The Sabres defeated the Atlanta Thrashers, now Winnipeg Jets, 4-3 in overtime. It was the second straight win in a game it trailed 3-0 following 4-3 victory over the Penguins. On March 3rd, the day of the trade deadline, the Sabres made two deals. The first was with the Columbus Blue Jackets, which sent them Nathan Pache and a second round draft pick in exchange for Rafi Torres. The Sabres' second and final deal sent Clark MacArthur to the Atlanta Thrashers for third and fourth round draft picks. On March 27th, the Sabres clinched their playoff berth for the first time since 2006-7 with a 7-1 road victory over the Tampa Bay Lightning. On April 6th, the Sabres clinched the Northeast Division title by defeating the New York Rangers by a score of 5-2. On April 26th, the third seed Sabres were eliminated from the Stanley Cup playoffs by the sixth seed Boston Bruins in six games. <sighs> the following season, 2010-11 roster did not make any significant changes whatsoever. One of the most notable moves the team made was the decision to waive center Tim Kennedy, a Buffalo native, to avoid paying the award he won in Arboration. Just continues to show the way they treated their players. It wasn't really good at all. Oh, Chris Jury and Daniel Briere, you guys were our team co-captains? Oh, well, we're gonna wait till the last minute to give you a contract. We're not gonna do it right now, so for the meantime, you could go pound sand. What were they all thinking, man? I just don't fucking understand. Like, I'm losing brain cells over this. Both defensemen, Henrik Talinder and Tony Ludman, longtime pair, were allowed to leave as free agents while the team signed veterans Jordan Leopold and Shane Morrison to replace them. Additionally, center Rob Niedermeyer was added as a Stanley Cup winning veteran presence. Just want to note that Rob Niedermeyer didn't do a 
fucking thing while he was here. I just want to point that out. Just some other moves I would like to mention here that weren't mentioned in the section looking here on the NHL trade tracker. The Sabres on February 26, 2008 acquire Steve Bernier and a 2008 first round pick, which was used to select Tyler Ennis for Brian Campbell, who goes to the San Jose Sharks, along with a 2008 seventh round pick that was used to select Drew Daniels. Only to have Steve Bernier on July 4th, 2008 be traded to the Canucks for second and third round picks in 2008. 2009 and 2010. Goes to show what I mean by you're not getting your value. You're not getting enough in return. Midway through the 2010-11 to season, on November 30th, 2010, Ken Campbell of the Hockey News reported a story that billionaire Terry Bagula had signed a letter of intent to purchase the Sabres for $150 million. Bagula was the founder, president, and CEO of East Resources, one of the largest privately held companies in the United States before he sold the company. After the report was released, least, Sabres managing partner Larry Quinn claimed it was, quote, untrue, but refused to further comment. The $150 million was later determined to be an undervalued amount as Forbes magazine had valued the team at just under $170 million in 2010. In December, Pagula officially expressed interest in buying the Sabres for that $170 million and submitted a letter of intent to the NHL in January. Galisano reportedly issued a counteroffer with an asking price of $175 million. Pagula and Galisano reached an agreement to sell the team on January 29th, 2011, with Pagula purchasing the team for $189 million, $175 million with the $14 million in debt included. With the Sabres and Galisano officially making an announcement in a press conference on February 3rd, 2011, NHL owners approved the sale on February 18th. In the conference, it was stated that an unnamed bidder submitted a much higher bid than Pagula's but made a big contingent upon moving the team. The description is is consistent with that of Jim Balsilli, who has made public his efforts to move a team to Hamilton, Ontario, a move the Sabres had actively opposed. Terry Bagula named former Pittsburgh Penguins executive Ted Black to be president of the team. Bagula was introduced as the Sabres owner in a public ceremony at HSBC Arena on February 23rd, accompanied by what would be the final appearance of all three members of the French Connection before Rick Martin's unfortunate death three weeks later. Around the 2010 to 11 trade deadline, the team attempted to trade Craig Reve, but was unsuccessful. After initially clearing waivers, Reve entered re-entry waivers and was claimed by the Columbus Blue Jackets. Late on February 27th, the team acquired Brad Boys from the St. Louis Blues in exchange for a second round draft pick. That was on February 27th, 2011, according to the NHL trade tracker. This was the Sabres' sole trade of the deadline after Bakula's official takeover of the team. The Sabres finished the regular season 16-4-4 never losing two consecutive games in that span, and landed the seventh seed in the Eastern Conference. Pagula's approach was credited by players, fans, and the public, with bringing new energy to the team, sparking a run to the playoffs that seemed improbable only months earlier. On April 8th, the Sabres clinched a playoff berth for the second consecutive season, defeating the Philadelphia Flyers 4-3 in overtime. The Sabres clinched the seventh seed and faced Philadelphia in the first round. The Sabres had three games to two lead, but lost in seven games to you guys. The Philadelphia Flyers once again. This was the start of the Terry Pagula era, which is 2010 to current day 2022. But after this is when the playoff drought would start. And that's the next section here. Playoff drought record. The Sabres began the 2011 to 12 season as part of the NHL Premier Series for the first time. Playing games in Finland and Germany, the team was particularly well received during a game against Adler Manningheim in the hometown of Sabres forward Jogan Hesch. Okay, so they were in Germany. It doesn't seem much during the start of the 2011 to 12 season, but it does mention in February of 2012 that Lindy Ruff named Jason Pomville the Sabres 13th full-time captain in team history. Again, the kiss of death because Craig Reve had it and then Craig Reve is gone. Just saying, it's the kiss of death, man. The Sabres begin the season relatively strong but collapsed after a Boston Bruins game in which Bruins forward Milan Lucci hit and injured goaltender Ryan Miller. Oh, I remember that. Fucking asshole. The subsequent months saw the Sabres collapse to last place in the Eastern Conference, despite a two-month rally that began in February along with the emergence of rookie forward Marcus Foligno. The Sabres lost the last two games of the regular season and fell three points short of a playoff spot. And yes, Marcus Foligno is related to Mike Foligno. The 2012-13 NHL lockout began, so it eliminated the first part of the 2012-13 season. Yes, there's been quite a few lockouts in the NHL. This ultimately began with a scheduled 48 games instead of the normal 82 games. After a 6-win, 10-loss, and 1-overtime 
loss start to the season, the contract of a longtime head coach, Lindy Ruff, was terminated by general manager Darcy Regeer on February 20th, 2013. I mean, can you really fucking blame Lindy? Can you really blame Lindy Ruff? Because of Darcy Regeer's incompetence? Kind of fucking sad that Regeer's the one to fire him, even though it's really Regeer's fault. This ends his 16... season tenure as Sabres head coach Ruff was replaced by Ron Ralston on an intern basis who then permanently became the head coach after the season ended. Due to the lockout shortened season the trade deadline was moved to April 3rd 2013 on the days leading up to it the Sabres were active in trades on March 15th the Sabres first trade sent TJ Brennan who was a draft pick to the Florida Panthers in exchange for a fifth round pick originally owned by the LA Kings in the 2013 draft. On March 30th the Sabres traded defenseman Jordan Leopold to the St. Louis Blues in exchange for a second round pick and conditional fifth round pick in the 2013 draft. On April 1st, the Sabres then traded Robin Regeer to the Los Angeles Kings in exchange for second round draft picks, one in 2014 and 2015. They previously traded Paul Byron and Chris Butler to the Flames for Regeer. So they're giving up young guys to get older guy only to trade them right then and there. Not saying that Chris Butler and Paul Byron ended up being much, but they were still young guys in your system that you traded for a top pairing defenseman in Robin Regeer and then he didn't stay long. Again, not getting what you wanted out of your investment. The final trade came on the day of the actual trade deadline, which was April 3rd, where the Sabres sent Jason Pominville, again, the kiss of death with this fucking captaincy, to the Minnesota Wild for Johan Larson and Matt Hackett. Who? Uh, just really aggravating. But the full trade on NHL Trade Tracker says, so the Wild acquired Jason Pomville in a 2014 fourth round pick for goalie Matt Hackett, forward Johan Larson in a 2013 first round pick and a 2014 second round pick on April 3rd, 2013, the start of the actual trade deadline. So the Sabres trade their team captain once again, and now here we are talking about a fucking rebuild, basically. So the official announcement came after the 3 p.m. deadline. At that time, the official announcement was not clear if there were other parts of the deal as the was still pending through the NHL's approval. It was later revealed that draft picks were also involved, which we just mentioned. The following season, on November 13, 2013, the team dismissed general manager Darcy Regeer and head coach Ron Ralston. What a fucking little too fucking late to do that move. Honestly, took you fucking six years too fucking late. Remove that fucking asshole. So former Sabres head coach Ted Nolan makes a return and is named as interim head coach for the remainder of that season. He was later signed to a three-year contract extension along with former Sabre Pat Lafon named as president of hockey operations. On January 9th, 2014, the Sabres hired Tim Murray as general manager. On February 28th of 2014, this is kind of worded weirdly, but basically Ted Nolan's hired, Pat LaFontaine's hired, Tim Murray's hired. Pretty self-explanatory, just a really weird wording on the article. Murray made his first major trade. So this is what I mean by the start of Tim Murray really rushing everything right away, right away. We gotta win now. We gotta, we gotta stockpile and win now and blah, 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 blah. The first thing Tim Murray did. The first thing he mentions in the interview I remember watching on the Sabres app. I used to, when I was younger, I would watch the Sabres app constantly, like just practices and just everything. And not that I really do that anymore, but when I was younger, I did it all the time. And the, one of the first things I remember in those videos, Tim Murray mentioning, the first thing he wanted to do was trade Ryan Miller. And that's exactly what happened. The Sabres trade star goalie Ryan Miller on February 28th, 2014. Miller is traded along with then captain, again, trading this captain, Steve Ott, named captain after Pollenville, who we traded from Dallas. So the Sabres trade your franchise goalie and Ryan Miller, your now new team captain and Steve Ott after you just traded your old team captain and Jason Pollenville. So this is what I'm saying, the kiss of fucking death. After you just recently acquired Steve Ott by trading Derek Roy. So they now go to the St. Louis Blues. So again, not getting enough in your investments here. In exchange for goaltender Yaroslav Halak forwards Chris Stewart and William Carrier along along with two draft picks. In just over three months, as president of hockey operations, Pat LaFontaine resigned from the Sabres to return to his previous position with the NHL on March 1st, 2014. Among highlights in the otherwise horrible 2013-14 season included the Buck Goal, in which severely short-staffed Sabres won their December 23rd contest against the Phoenix Coyotes when Coyotes goaltender Mike Smith backed into his own goal with a puck lodged in his pants and the lone NHL appearance
appearance of former Lancaster High School goaltender Ryan Vince, who was working as a videographer in the Sabres organization, suited up as backup goalie in the wake of the Ryan Miller trade. Because Yaroslav Halak did not want to play for the Buffalo Sabres. He was literally traded a fucking day after this trade. He wanted nothing to do with the Sabres, did not want to play with them. He was traded, like, after literally a day, I'm pretty sure. I'll double check that. But I remember he wasn't here. He was literally here for a minute. He was literally here for a minute. The Sabres finished the 2013-14 to season last in the NHL once again missing the playoffs. At 2013, I watched that whole season. That was the tank season. That was just fucking rough. Just some moves that weren't mentioned in the article. Dallas Stars acquired Derek Roy on July 2nd, 2012 for Steve Ott and Adam Party. Sabres get no draft picks, trade once again one of their top players, and just didn't get enough out of that investment. But the Dallas Stars didn't really get much out of Derek Roy either. Obviously, Jordan Leopold's traded for draft picks. Robert Gears traded for draft picks. Jason Palmville's traded for players and draft picks. During the tank season, the Carolina Hurricanes acquire Andre Sakara for defenseman Jamie McBain along with a 2013 second round pick that is used to select JT Comper. July 7, 2013, the Sabres reacquire Henrik Talinder for Riley Boychuk. October 27th, 2013, the Sabres trade Thomas Vanek to the New York Islanders for Matt Molson, a 2014 first round pick and a 2015 second round pick. On December 19th, 2013, the Buffalo Sabres acquire Linus Olsen Omar, not Linus Omar, Linus Omar from the Edmonton Oilers for a 2014 conditional, which ended up being a six round pick. Obviously, Miller gets traded. We talked about that. So it says on March 5th, 2014, Yaroslav Halak is traded to the Washington Capitals along with a third round pick for Michael Neuwirth. And on March 5th, 2014, the Sabres trade Matt Molson along with Cody McCormick for Tory Mitchell, a 2014 second rounder and a 2016 second rounder. On March 5th, 2014, the Sabres acquire Hudson Fashing and Nicholas Delorier for two second round picks, Brandon McNabb and Jonathan Parker. Those were the trades that happened during the tank year. At the time, I didn't understand exactly what the Sabres were doing because they trade for Matt Molson. They later trade him, but then rumors came at the end of the season that they were going to resign both Molson and McCormick, which they did. They trade Brandon McNabb. They get Delorier, who ends up being a bottom six piece, but he didn't do much here. Hudson Fashing never accumulated to getting onto the NHL roster. He was always in the farm system, and they ended up trading him to the Arizona Coyotes, which we'll talk about later, and he's still in the AHL. He's never gone to the NHL, so I don't understand what the hype was about trading two second-round picks for Hudson Fashing. I'm still over here saying, who the hell was Hudson Fashing? And then the Kings get Brandon McNabb, who later emerges as an NHL defenseman, now with the Vegas Golden Knights, and just, like I said, continuing to mention here, Sabres don't get enough on their investments. Really, nobody has any idea what the fuck this team's doing at this point. It's just, it's a mess. It's a complete mess and still over here losing brain cells. And there's still much more to talk about with the Buffalo Sabres, but we're going to go over that in part two. I'm going to end it here on part one. We're about two hours in, and this is taking a lot longer than I thought it would, but we're also talking about 51 plus years of a franchise here. So we're going to cut it short today. Uh, if I missed anything, let me know in the comment section, or if you have my number or whatever, text me and I'll add it. But there's a lot to go over. I'm going to end it here at the tank season before we get into the following year and Jack Eichel and everything else. Just going over the 19. 19- 70 season up to the tank season and in the next video we're going to go from the tank season up to this past year with Donald Granado and Kevin Adams and the Sabres and whatnot so we're going to cut it here but just if, you're, if you listen up to this point you know I appreciate it this this is taking me quite a bit to make but you know this is something I like to do and we're going to continue making these videos and we're just going to see where it goes from here and we're also going to talk about a little bit more about Jenneret in the next video considering this was his last call like I mentioned and we know here in Buffalo so we're going to just cut it short today we're going to go over more in the next video and i look forward to seeing you guys in that video so if you've listened up to this point and you've taken the time out of your busy schedule to listen to this all the way through i appreciate it and thank you and we'll see you the next video here on the slag and mccracken sports podcast i just want to give my condolences to the families that unfortunately lost their loved ones in the mass shooting that happened on jefferson avenue at tops and that's just unfortunate that it happened we condemn racism here we don't like racism we want nothing to do with racism and we choose love here on the slag and mccracken sports podcast podcast so i just wanted to take a moment to you know give my condolences because that shit's messed up and it, there's no place in this world for that and just for it to happen at a grocery store it's just it's it's insane uh just exactly what the what we have to deal with in the world today and just how it's just crazy it's just it, it it's just it's just really messed up what happened and uh setting prayers to those families because it's just it's just unfortunate 
and it's just unreal that that happens so it's not fair to those families that have to go through that and it's certainly uh, heartbreaking and it's just it's, it's just not fair and uh you shouldn't hate somebody or want to kill people just because of the pigment of their skin it's 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 messed up and there's no place for that kind of shit it's just disgusting and i hope i hope this guy gets what he gets because it's just it's messed up it's really messed up there's no place in this world for that kind of shit there really isn't and we're just gonna end the video here today though but i just wanted to give that final note on that because it's really just fucked up and it's just crazy how it's this close to home too and just it's really messed up so sending prayers sending love and all that and uh we'll we'll have part two for the sabers coming out and just look forward to seeing you guys in the next video so again thanks if you listen to this point Damn,